Good morning, everyone. In the interest of uh, starting on time and getting everybody out of here on time, we want to go ahead and get started. Uh, so if folks could start wrapping up the pregame and uh, let's get started and get going. Okay. So good morning again. I'm Fred Blackwell, on, and on behalf of the other co-chairs, want to welcome you to uh, this meeting, uh, which we think is going to should be a pretty exciting one for folks. After you know going slugging through a lot of really detailed conversations on all the action plans that the work group moderators and uh, committees have put together, uh, today we get to look at the entire package, uh, and I think. Uh, the, the looking at the entire package is going to be a theme for today uh, because we really want you to kind of think about this as the complete set of strategies that we would work on and not think about them uh, as the, uh, your favorite ones that you would want to cherry pick uh, and run with. Uh, we're really trying to figure out a way to keep us glued together and committed to uh, an entire set of things. Um, before we uh, jump into the um, meeting. One of the things that I want to do first is kind of fall on our sword a little bit um, and acknowledge the fact that we have uh, scheduled this meeting on one of the holiest days in Judaism, uh, Yom Kippur. So I uh, want to acknowledge the folks who uh, aren't here because they are observing that and uh, again kind of uh, apologize for our lack of cultural competence in, the, in terms of the way that we've um, organize this today. Um, so with that, we have a, a few items here. Um, uh, one is we want to talk a little bit, and uh, we have a team of folks that are going to uh, uh, present to you uh, some of the, the back of the envelope, if you will, around uh, what we think all the stuff that we have kind of put on the Christmas tree cost. Um, the, the second thing that we want to do is have a conversation about um, geography uh, in relationship to uh, the things that we're putting forward. I mean, one of the things that we talked a lot about uh, over the course of the last uh, year or so is the fact that um, while we want to have a regional frame here, we're pretty certain uh, that one size doesn't fit all and that there uh, in each one of the or different communities that we're working in, everybody's working with a different context. Uh, and therefore, uh, doses of different strategies are going to need to be different. And there's been a group that's done a tremendous amount of work to kind of take that into account and think about it, and they're going to uh, share some of that work with you. Uh, and then the bulk of the meeting is going to be uh, around um, going through and reacting to uh, the package uh, that you have in front of you. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to spend very little time uh, teeing it up for you, but then we're going to uh, break you down into some smaller groups and spend some time discussing it there and then have a, uh, a larger group discussion uh, about where we are. And we have some very specific questions that we're going to want people to tackle in that uh, large group setting. And then uh, we're going to close. Um, and so um, with that, let me turn it over to Steve, uh, who I think is going to be handling the first item. Thank you, Fred, and welcome uh, all of you back, I think, after a little uh, summer vacation. Um, I'm going to talk about and just tee up the revenue conversation. Um, and uh, we've been, as Fred said, uh, talking quite a bit about things that will cost a lot of money. So now it's time to start talking about where we find that money. And I'll, I'll start maybe with uh, the fact that Mike and I went in to brief uh, Mayor Breed about CASA a couple days ago. She accused us of being Trinitarians um, because we kept referring to the three Ps. Um, and I don't know about Mike, but I'll plead guilty to uh, Trinitarianism because I like to group things into three. And I've got three of them for you to kick this conversation off. Uh, the first is uh, your three Ps are very expensive. Um, and uh, we've, we've done a scan. Uh, and you'll get some detail on it in a second, uh, that suggests it's at least $1.5 billion per year. 
is our bogey. Um, and that's a lot of money to raise anywhere, anytime. Um, but it does give us a target. Uh, I doubt we're going to get all there in one legislative session or in one election. Uh, but the hope is that we could fashion a consensus that is enduring uh, and that will see us through a couple of sessions and a couple of elections uh, where we ought to be able to do some serious damage uh, to that number. The second is you will note that we have organized these revenue ideas uh, when Vikrant presents them sort of according to communities of interest. So we could raise money from property owners, from developers, from employers, from local government, from taxpayers, from philanthropy. And, you know, one approach might be let's figure out who we could gang up on, who's the least popular, uh, and try to jam it down their throat. Um, and I probably wouldn't recommend that strategy. Uh, I, I think what might make more sense, and we're very much looking forward to your reaction on this point after you've seen the information, is a share the pain strategy. Um, and given how deep and broad the financial challenge is, I think sharing the pain not only makes some political sense, but it probably is going to make some financial sense too, because there is just not enough money in anybody any single pocket uh, to make this thing work. The third is just to maybe leave you with a story, uh, and the story I hope suggests to you that, that we ought to keep hope alive. Um, and the story goes back to the early 80s when the transportation community was despairing of ever raising money in the gas tax in either Sacramento or Washington and decided uh, to take a flyer on a new approach, which was to raise money at the local level. Um, and in 1984, Santa Clara County, in fact, became the first county in the state of California to raise its own money for transportation improvements. Uh, and they have been followed by most of the counties where most of the population of the state lives. And as of this year, 35 years later, uh, we've raised $70 billion for transportation improvements statewide. A lot of that by two-thirds voting margins. Um, so to me, that suggests there is hope. I, I know transportation and housing are not identical subjects, nor do they resonate with the public in an identical way. Uh, but the fact that we have been that successful uh, suggests to me that we've got the chance of trying to replicate that success in the housing arena. Um, and. Uh, if you're keeping score, you know, $70 billion over 35 years is about $2 billion a year on average. So uh, the $1.5 billion maybe doesn't sound so far away. So, Ken, I'll turn it over to you, uh, and uh, we look forward to your reaction to what you're about to see. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just picking up on what Steve said, adding to it just a bit, and then Vikrat and I are going to walk through this presentation. Um, this is a first pass for you all. We're going to be bringing this back to you in October with more detail. We're doing more analysis in terms of what would be needed in terms of voter approval, legislative approval, how it may relate to a regional housing entity to stand this whole thing up. Um, I think all of the ideas, in addition to kind of a spread the pain approach, um, they're also based upon the idea of the CASA Compact, that this is about the three Ps and that for CASA to really be successful, we have to move forward on all fronts. And so the revenue ideas are in part um, to support, for example, local government. If they are going to uh, advance development more expeditiously and, and roll back some costs, how would those costs be adjusted for uh, through other revenue? So that's the basic framework. Um, and we're going to try to go through this fairly quickly, um, give you enough detail to think about what's what's before you, uh, then open it up for questions and, and so forth. So with that, Vikram, you want to sure. get us started? Thanks, Ken. Uh, one other thing I would mention is that we have action plans for each of the ideas that we're going to present today. So uh, we will, uh, as you're leaving, we will give you a packet for that. We didn't want to bring it up front because we were still working on it. But before you leave, please, uh, if you need more details on any of these ideas, you can uh, grab one of those packets. So I think Steve kind of has already covered the first four slides that I was going to present. But uh, again, to go over this, we need new sources of revenue to pay for all of the CASA initiatives. We need some sort of a regional entity to collect uh, and then uh, strategically invest 
uh, these new revenues, and we need to give this entity some financial tools so that they can fund uh, and build some infrastructure and, um, and housing projects. Uh, this is the slide that I think uh, Steve was referring to in terms of what our, um, what our gap is, and this chart to the left shows really the, the, the gap that we have for uh, building affordable housing, so subsidized housing for low and very low income households based on the current RENA numbers. So just based on that, for affordable housing production, we have a gap of about $1.7 billion annually. Uh, we, we think that's a good ballpark to kind of work towards, as, as Steve said, for the entire CASA um, uh, package of initiatives uh, because it's not too small and it's not too big and something that we can work with, uh, given that we also need to um, raise local uh, revenue, but also, you know, this $1.68 billion uh, assumes that there is a matching amount of money that's coming from the federal and the state uh, sources as well. So this is what Steve was talking about in terms of uh, so uh, local self-help, so $1.5, $1.7 billion seems like a lot, uh, but we have raised more than that for transportation. Uh, so the, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, there are, uh, the, to the left of that chart is the affordable housing piece, the amount of money that we currently have for subsidized affordable housing. To the right is what we are currently raising for transportation. The two things that are missing on the left is the regional part and the state part. So I think we can talk about that. But the options we are presenting today uh, is to do with that, uh, uh, that salmon color or the red color, the regional portion of it. Um, it's always good to uh, start with asking, you know, so we've answered the question how much, uh, but then who's to blame? Uh, and you ask different people, they'll, uh, you know, tell you who is to, you know, who's to blame for this uh, housing crisis. But if you ask the general public in the poll, they say everybody. And that's, again, the guiding principle for uh, the recommendations, as Steve said, uh, we have for you today. It's uh, we think we need to spread the pain. Uh, we think that you can't gang up on one or two sectors. If you are not able to contribute, then you, it's hard for you to ask somebody else to contribute. Uh, for all of these funding ideas, we definitely will need state legislation, so state enabling legislation. Uh, and in some cases, voter approval, but we're still working on what that means for each of the ideas that we are presenting today, and we'll come back to you with more details on that. So jumping straight into that, so the, 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 the first idea is this inflation-indexed windfall tax. Again, Prop 13 and our overall tax system um, provides a lot of benefits to homeowners, and that benefit can be passed on from one generation to the next. Uh, and some say that that is one reason we have such a huge wealth inequity within California as well. So what this proposal does, and it's described more in the action plan that you will get at the end of the meeting, is uh, it takes a portion of that win of the capital gains, uh, from, and that's the difference between what you bought the home for and what you sold the home for. It takes that portion uh, and, and, and taxes 3.35% on the portion within that, a subset of that, that is not uh, subject to federal taxes. So the first $500,000 that you make on your house as capital gains is exempt from the federal sources for a couple, uh, and for a single, it's 250000 So that's the part that we're looking at. So for that portion, you adjust it for inflation, and then you uh, adjust it for the closing cost, and what's remaining is about 3.35%. So if you sell a house for a million dollars and you bought it for $100,000, um, you know, you take the first 500,000, you apply the 3.15% uh, to that after you adjust for inflation and um, closing costs, that's the amount that we would be asking. So it would be roughly around like $1,500. Um, the parcel tax, we passed a similar measure uh, in 2016. It was measure AA and that was for $12 a parcel. Uh, which would rate, raise $25 million for uh, saving the bay. Uh, so this proposal is asking for four times that much to raise the $100 million. And actually, I forgot to mention that we've adjusted all of the um, tax rates and fees so that we can get to $100 million each for each of the ideas. So to some extent, it's an arbitrary tax rate, and we can uh, look at raising that or dropping that uh, to make it more feasible. Uh, I should uh, also mention that... Uh, for any regional source, there is always this question of return to source. So if you're raising money from 
one county, but we are investing it at the, at the regional level, uh, does that money eventually have to go back to um, that particular county? And that needs to still be resolved. But uh, our proposal, at least for all of these ideas, is that the money goes to a regional pot and then is the, the, the regional entity or whoever is making the decision is making strategic investments around the, around the region, considering the region as, a, as one entity. So, uh, so that's the parcel tax. So the, the tax is imposed irrespective of the use. So if it's a residential use or a commercial use, irrespective of the size of the parcel, so it could be a small parcel, large parcel, everybody pays the same uh, parcel tax. And that's uh, a limitation set on us by uh, state law. Uh, the next idea is uh, real estate transfer tax, and this is something that a lot of the cities in the, in the Bay Area already have. Uh, it ranges anywhere from a little bit more than a dollar per thousand uh, of the sale price. So if you sell it for, you know, sell your home for a hundred, uh, for a million dollars, uh, then it would be 1.35% for uh, every thousand dollars. So it'll be 13.75 or 1335 in that particular case. So 1.35 per thousand of the sale price. Um, it ranges anywhere from $1.1 uh, per thousand in the East Bay to about $25 for every thousand uh, dollars in, in San Francisco. And San Francisco also uh, makes it a little bit more progressive where the rate rises as the value of the home sold rises as well. So um, higher pr uh, price properties pay a higher tax. Again, that you know, we, we've set the rate right now to reach the 100, 100 million figure. The vacant homes tax, and this is modeled on the Vancouver's uh, empty homes tax. The idea is that uh, we have a housing emergency. So if you own a second home or if you're uh, leasing out your home uh, through uh, short-term rentals, uh, that may not be in the best interest of the entire region. Uh, and so if you have a vacant home uh, that you haven't rented for more than six months in a particular year, uh, we would assess a 1% of your total assessed value as a tax every year. Uh, and again, the, there are a little bit more details on this in the action plans, but really it is modeled on almost entirely on the Vancouver model, which we think is, has been fairly successful because it raised about $30 million uh, last year and brought about 3,000 to 4,000 units online overnight without any cost to the, to the public into the rental market. Uh, and that is for a city that's smaller than uh, San Francisco. Uh, the final idea under property owners is uh, something that is similar in intent to the one before that, but is targeted more to the short-term rental market. Uh, and we see this as a particular issue in San Francisco and the wine country or wherever we don't have enough um, hotel rooms, but there's a large um, tourism industry. Um, and the idea there would be for the total amount of money that is paid to a homeowner or sorry, the, the, the host uh, for every short term rental, there would be a 25% charge uh, that would go into a regional pot to raise the 100 million. It could be lower than that to make it a little bit more feasible, but there are many, there are dozens of cities in the region that already charge this uh, fee. Uh, it ranges anything from 8% to 14%. I think San Francisco has 12%, Oakland, San Jose also have it. Uh, many of the jurisdictions in the peninsula uh, have a similar tax, but again, they're somewhere in the 10 to 12% uh, range. Uh, moving on to the, uh, the developer category, uh, the commercial linkage fee proposal that we've put forth is uh, similar in many ways to the local commercial linkage fees, uh, but there, there's a key difference in the proposal that we have. First, it's regional, uh, and the second, that we are varying it by the size of the development and where it is located. So if you are located uh, outside a transit-served area, we charge you a higher fee. If you're located in a jurisdiction that has a jobs housing balance that's higher than 1.5, we would charge you a higher fee. If you have a large development, and we just put an arbitrary uh, threshold there for, if the development is for 100 workers, uh, we would charge you a higher fee unless you provide housing on site as well. Uh, and again, the fee schedule is in the uh, action plan, so you can look at that, but uh, if you apply this region-wide, uh, the, the, the commercial linkage fee would be anywhere between two to eight dollars a square foot, uh, which is lower than what most jurisdictions currently charge. So there are about 
uh, three dozen uh, jurisdictions in the Bay Area that already have a commercial linkage fee. Um, the thing to note here is that it is a one-time fee. It's not an annual recurring payment from the developer, but because we have new development every year occurring uh, at a steady pace, if, it, if that were the case, then we would have a steady stream of um, funding per year as well. The, the variation we have on that is a flat tax. So this is, very, this is more similar to the local taxes. So it would be a $5 per square foot flat tax uh, when you build new development anywhere in the region of any size um, and whether or not served by transit. So that's just a, a, a variation to show you what the, scale, what the amount of taxes would be if you applied it uniformly um, versus you applied it based on the location and the size of the development. Uh, we have a parallel proposal uh, for employers. So it's, again, this, the idea is that employers would pay a head tax, so that's a tax per uh, employee, uh, and we still need to figure out if that is per FTE to get around the, the issue of contract workers or part-time workers. But uh, again, we would charge a higher fee if you are located outside a transit-served area, if you're located in a jurisdiction with a, a job housing ratio that is um, more than 1.5, and if you have uh, more than 100 workers in any particular location, then you would be paying a higher fee. Uh, again, the range there is between $8 to $64 per head. Uh, as a comparison, uh, Oakland and San Jose already have a head tax, and they charge it as a business uh, tax to their uh, employers, and it ranges for San Jose anything from 72 to 100 um, dollars per employee based on the sector uh, and in Oakland I believe it's up to uh, 350 dollars a head based on the uh, sector that you're um, looking at. There is, there were uh, a, a two uh, proposals in the Bay Area that were going to go to the November ballot for head taxes in the, at the local level. One was in Cupertino, another one in Mountain View. I believe the Cupertino one was pulled back uh, based on pushback from large employers there. And that was the same case in Seattle. They passed, this council there passed the uh, head tax of about $225 a head, uh, but then rescinded it uh, the next, I think, week based on, um, because of the pushback from employers. So parallel to the, the developer commercial linkage fee, even for the head tax, we have a flat fee. So it's $30 per head. Uh, for every employee uh, in the region, small businesses, large businesses located anywhere um, in the region, uh, just to give you a sense of what, how that compares with the variable tax rates. For the employers, we also are proposing as an option a gross receipts tax. Uh, San Francisco passed one a few years ago. Uh, San Jose and Oakland also have it. Usually a gross receipts tax is uh, at a state level, so that's the most common but some of the cities do uh, pass additional gross receipts tax in lieu of um, a, uh, a payroll tax. So San Francisco, for example, is phasing out the payroll tax and phasing in the gross receipts tax. And we use the same rates uh, that vary by sector and by size of the firm that San Francisco, ha San Francisco has for the proposal that we put forth. Again, we think a one-twelfth of a cent uh, tax um, per um, per dollar of gross receipts uh, for every uh, economic activity in the Bay Area could generate about $100 million of total revenue. Uh, the last one, and this is a little, uh, this is interesting. It, it, we, we added it, this option recently. It's a VMT tax uh, or a VMT fee on employers. So the difference between a VMT fee, uh, which is similar to a congestion pricing uh, system, is that A, for congestion pricing, you usually charge the driver. Uh, the fee for having the privilege of driving, let's say, in a central business district. Uh, in this case, if your employee drives to work, we'll charge you a fee. Um, and that's, again, a way f to get to the congestion and location issue for employers, but also to raise uh, new sources of revenue. Uh, the other difference is that it's not congestion-based. Uh, so you don't have to be driving it, it during congestion hours. It just has to be a commute uh, trip. So uh, I'll, take a, I'll just pause there and see if there are any clarifying questions at this point. If you could hold your comments about the different ideas till the end. But if you have any qu clarifying questions, I can answer that. And then Ken will cover the rest of the ideas. 
Uh, just a question whether or not you've tried to think about the substitution effects that there, that you might have in shrinking the tax base from some of these taxes. Uh, sorry, say that again. The substitution effect where, where the amount of the thing that you're taxing might decrease in response to the size of the tax. That's right. So that was, uh, you know, the, the policy outcome uh, for some of these ideas like the vacant homes tax and the commercial linkage, not the commercial linkage fee as much as uh, the VMT fee is that it would, we are hoping, also affect behavior. Uh, so the goal for, for example, the vacant homes tax is to raise zero revenue in the future because you want to bring all of the um, uh, all of the vacant homes to the rental market. So you're right. Some of them are there to change behavior, and over time they may not generate as much revenue if the policy is effective. Just a quick clarifying question here. So for things like the um, uh, um, the uh, commercial linkage fees, did these numbers reflect a fee that's that's applied in the jurisdictions where where there isn't already a, a, a linkage fee, or is this inclusive of those linkage fees? Is this is this to fill? This is just to fill the regional funding gap need that we've identified. Is that correct? That's correct. So in many cases, as you mentioned there are local fees as well. So for now, to calculate the $100 million, this would be on top of everything that the locals are charging. So this does not adjust currently for the local fee, uh, which is a good point. Uh, that still needs to be resolved uh, because different cities do have, for example, different commercial linkage fee, which may be higher or lower than what we're proposing. So how, did this, um, how is this compatible with that? Uh, but then there are also jurisdictions that don't, don't have the political will to pass some of the, uh, these fees and taxes at the local level, so this could provide um, the cover for, for us to charge it at the regional level. But you're right, we still have to reconcile this with the local fees that's already in place. Did you um, assume that there would be any exemptions, for instance, for tax-exempt users? Uh, yes. So, for example, for the parcel tax, we think there should be an exemption for low-income parcel owners. Uh, that was not the case with, with Measure AA. Uh, again, I didn't go over those details, but where we think there should be a, an exemption, we've included that in the action plans. Uh, so, for example, even with the commercial linkage fee, there could be an exemption for nonprofit organizations and government entities. Um, but that is an open question. For now, we did not uh, include those exemptions in the calculation, but that's a question identified in the action plans. Question. Just as a follow-up to the question around the the relationship to the local fees and taxes, I mean, I think there's a real threat that if you impose a regional fees and taxes that a lot of localities will then do away with their own, and so you'll have, you know, you won't really have the net gain. You'll just have a substitution of that fee for a regional fee. Right. And again, that needs to be reconciled. Um, you know, once we have... Uh, for now, we're looking for direction from you in terms of which concept uh, makes more sense. Uh, we definitely want to have at least one source of revenue per column, uh, but uh, I think we need to dig deeper to uh, figure out some of those questions as a next step. Sorry, Bakran, uh, oh. um, can you explain how the key works on here? Oh, uh, so... Uh, so like we said, so for all of these ideas, there will be, we will, we will, we will need some sort of enabling legislation at the state level uh, because some sort of a regional entity would need to be enabled to impose these taxes. Um, and then for some of them, we might even need voter approval, uh, like with measure AA, which was a parcel tax, which was passed in two, uh, 2016. So we are still working on, you know, what that, uh, what each of the, ideas that we have come up with need. Uh, but you know the, the, the two variations there is either you need a simple majority or a two-thirds majority. So for the state legislature, it's the same thing. For the voters, it's the same thing. And eventually, we want to we bring back the information so that it informs your decisions on which of these ideas will need a state legislation with two-thirds majority versus simple majority. And then if and whether, whether or not you need a voter approval, and whether that will be a two-thirds or a simple majority. So we still need to do that work. Amy. And I assume you'll highlight which needs both, 
the right. state legislative vote and the vote of the people. That's correct. All right, that was a lot, and there's more. Um, <laughs> so stay tuned. Um, and we, we do want to emphasize that this is the, this is the first uh, bite at the apple you have. Um, if you have questions today as you're hearing the presentations, write them down on your post-its, pass them in. We'd love to get that information. Between now and the October meeting when this will be brought back to you, um, if you have questions, comments, what, what have you, don't hesitate to email us because we really want to get your input as we're doing more work on the proposals. So the next item under the local government column uh, would call for the state legislature to enact a law that would require local governments in the Bay Area to pool 17.5% of their future property tax growth increments from all development starting in 2020. And again, this is based upon the $100 million figure that we're trying to reach. So it would be $100 million every year that would be generated by jurisdictions doing this. It's based uh, in part upon an existing statute that's existed since the 1970s in the Twin Cities region, uh, where the Metropolitan Council, which is the MPO for Minneapolis St. Paul, has revenue raising authority. And it's almost uh, sort of the opposite of Prop 13, or the fiscalization of land use. They have a regional framework where they defiscalize land use and they redistribute uh, the top 40% of property tax uh, growth across jurisdictions in their region based upon the need. What we're proposing, again, aiming for that $100 million annual figure is comparatively modest, 17.5%, and we're saying that it would go toward housing. Next slide. So redevelopment and the loss of redevelopment is something you're all very aware of. Um, with this proposal, uh, it's sort of a redevelopment 2.0 proposal that would call for a couple of things. One would be that the legislature would pass a law, or the legislature would pass a law and would require, among other things, that cities and counties set aside 27.5% of redevelopment revenue for affordable housing. Uh, it would differ from redevelopment 1.0 in a couple of respects. Um, special districts and school funding would be left untouched. They would not be part of this. Um, and it would apply tax increment financing to transit priority areas. So these are the state recognized transit areas uh, that have also been uh, recognized in SB 35, uh, in SB uh, 827, it was the geography that was used. So it's using that same geography that's used statewide uh, related to regional planning. It would be the mechanism for redevelopment 2.0 under this proposal and it would uh, provide for 100, uh, again, $100 million annually. Next slide. The California Surplus Land Act, as many of you probably know, requires that uh, government entities make surplus land available for affordable housing. They're supposed to provide a notification when they have surplus land uh, that they're no longer going to use and, and make it potentially available for affordable housing. That's actually a requirement of the One Bay Area Grant Program that MTC has now. That requirement only goes so far. It's a notification requirement and it's through self-certification. What we're proposing in this proposal is that for a, with a target of $100 million a year and looking at the value of land uh, based upon uh, 50 units per acre, so fairly conservative, that 20 acres of land would be made available for affordable housing within the region annually uh, to drive down the cost of affordable housing. This is one where there's a lot of work that would need to happen in terms of how those lands would be identified, what the mechanism would be. Um, these are lands that could be uh, under the ownership of local government, uh, could be transit agencies, uh, other public agencies. But the idea is to build upon the Surplus Land Act and what it calls for in terms of notification and really create a program that moves land toward affordable housing in the region. Next slide. The next one is easy. No, none of this is easy. Uh, but the next one is, is fairly easy to explain in that it is a regional sales tax. Again, with a target of $100 million generated annually, 
this proposal would call for a tax of one sixteenth cent applied across the nine counties. Uh, so in that sense, a fairly modest increase, but one that would be applied throughout the Bay Area um, and would require state legislation to do this. Again, it would generate $100 million each year. Um, a lot more work would need to occur in terms of how this could advance, um, but that's, that's the general idea. And now the last one is general ob obligation bonds, bonds being a loan, um, using GO bonds as a way to raise money through a regional housing entity for affordable housing that would be reauthorized every five years and would generate $100 million every year. Um, I think on this item, it's worth noting that a lot of the items on the page require the creation of a regional housing entity of some sort. To really stand up uh, these different mechanisms is going to take a, a location, an entity, to make this possible. Some of these would be easier to do in terms of implementation. Many of them are challenging in terms of the legislature. Um, but nonetheless, it's going to create a, an organizing mechanism to move them forward. So that will be part of the discussion as we advance this discussion. Uh, next slide. Philanthropy is a relatively new source of revenue in the region. Uh, it's represented here at CASA uh, through the San Francisco Foundation and CZI as one of the preeminent uh, efforts moving forward in the region. Uh, we think it's an opportunity for the region to uh, leverage different funds, uh, including those that would come from the various sectors that are identified on the page. Um, I'm sure we're going to be talking more about that in the future. Next slide. So one additional important piece of work that still needs to happen with whatever CASA advances through the compact in terms of revenue is how to spend the money. Uh, as uh, Vikrant mentioned earlier on in this presentation, we're working off a couple of different figures. We're working off the, the amount of money that's needed to fund the affordable housing gap itself. Uh, your discussions have had to do with a whole range of things. The basic framework of this compact is going to be the three Ps. What we have up here on the screen is one potential way you could go. We think there's a lot more work that is needed here. But one potential way to go could be to have 60% of the funding go toward the production of affordable housing itself. Um, it could be through grants and financing. Uh, we could prioritize project and transit priority areas and high opportunity areas. Uh, we could tie it to some of the workforce training programs that have been discussed as part of this effort. We could look at the acquisition of land. We've also talked a lot about affordable housing preservation um, and preserving the existing affordable housing stock that, that exists here in the region, either in the market that's currently not deed restricted or affordable housing projects that are going to lose their HUD financing in the future. Um, that could be one of the areas where this funding goes. Perhaps 20% uh, is the right percentage. Perhaps it's not. Tenant protection services in terms of protecting folks from displacement. Uh, right now, we don't have money for that. So how much of this money should go toward the protection of our most vulnerable folks in terms of displacement? Uh, and displacement of their communities. Maybe 10 percent is the right figure, perhaps it's not. And then lastly, looking at production, uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone into really trying to look at how impact fees at the local level could be capped or limited or rolled back, how we could streamline the process to get more housing built. But if local jurisdictions are going to take a hit in terms of the amount of money they are taking in relative to housing, and given that so many have enterprise programs to fund their basic infrastructure around housing, we would have to figure out a way to backfill that because for many jurisdictions, if it's not addressed, they won't be able to do that or do it as well as we are proposing. So again, there's going to be a lot more discussion you all will be having on this moving forward. This is just kind of a first look. One uh, source of revenue that we have uh, but that still requires the approval of the Bay Area Toll Authority is 
infrastructure related financing uh, for BATA, which is associated with MTC. Um, as you all know, uh, financing the cost of housing is in part significantly related to the cost of infrastructure. Uh, what this infrastructure bank could potentially support is the financing through patient loans of infrastructure. It could be for sewers, it could be for water, sidewalks. A lot of the costs of housing and affordable housing that isn't directly housing per se, but is a big par part of the cost of housing. Uh, we think it could lower financing costs, um, hopefully accelerate implementation, particularly for projects that are deeply affordable. Uh, it could make our projects here in the region uh, more competitive for statewide funds such as the ASIC fund um, and could result in more affordable units because it just creates a larger pot of money uh, for the advancement of housing in the region. Next slide. So uh, next steps. This is the first look at proposals uh, and we're going to open it up for further discussion in a moment. Uh, we're going to bring it back to you in October after bringing this same general presentation to the steering committee next week. In November, we're going to have a discussion uh, with our commission about transportation funding conditioning for housing outcomes, and the infrastructure bank will go to the Bay Area Toll Authority. And then in November and December, we're going to have a telephone poll to see uh, what people in the region might think of all these ideas. So. Steve had his light on. I saw it go off. Mike has his on. Yeah, I'm going to um, give a little bit mini background just so you know how we got here and then why we are excited about this. When this first got introduced with the chart, if you could put that one back up with all the options and how many people we could ask for money, it was originally $250 million per box. And the theory was, well, maybe we can get more from these and more from those and none from these. And these are really hard and these are easy and all of that. So we got a headache. And... What, what we are always reflecting back on is Dave Cortese at the steering committee's comments to us in the very first meeting when he said, if you guys are going to do this, be bold. So what this evolved into, and, and if you think about this at 30,000 feet, which is where I work the best, um, this is a little bit, if you remember the Simpson-Bowles concept. When Simpson-Bowles put together a program to fix the government spending, it hurt somebody on every, at one box or another but you had 11 things that you liked. And so this concept is um, a regional concept. It takes into account every element of people who pay. And it's based on the premise that we're all here because we want to be here and we're all here to try to fix this. And we have a crisis. And so we've approached it from a regional concept from a maybe this is a 15 year, 20 year program of, of uh, trying to get us back on track. We're not sure about that. But what you have today, and you all heard about these, when Mountain View goes after its corporate citizens, they rail, and it gets overturned or kicked out it, because each city doesn't want to solve it themselves. So the beauty of this, if forgetting the technicality of some of these issues, which is no small thing, is, and what we're trying to embrace here is could we get behind a solution that is, um, doesn't have a target? It has everybody as a target. And if the solution here is, geez, I really don't like having my property taxes increased, but if the Cisco's and the um, Genentech's are going to pay, maybe that's fair. And Genentech says, I don't like a head tax, but if this happens and that happens. So that's the concept. And I think as you heard and the questions you asked, which were good, um, and my guess is we don't have too many answers to those technical ones, but it is the concept that if we could get behind jump-starting this housing crisis, jump-starting the need to get money, we're ubiquitous in who we ask it from. Uh, it's painful for a lot of factors and a lot to be worked out, but that's where we are, and I think that's why um, we believe this is worth exploring in, with a, a lot of enthusiasm. So um, we've got about 15 or so, 20 minutes or so for discussion on this. And so I would imagine that there's some questions and comments. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say if you want to write a check, you can do that too. 
<laughs> uh, Fred, I just wanted to uh, add one thought to, to Mike's uh, summary, which I thought was a good one. Um, the strategy here, as I said earlier, is sort of sh share or spread the pain. But I think it's fair to say that all of these ideas don't spread the pain equally. The, the reason we wanted it to be arbitrary, and whether it's 100 or 200 or whatever, was to demonstrate to you the differences in the rates that result, right? And the fact is, a 1 16th cent sales tax is going to be hard to find on a bill for your washing machine. Um, but a $48 per year parcel tax will be, right? Because we just passed a measure for the Bay that was only 12 bucks, and it, it's not like it passed by 40 percentage points. So the fact is, the, the political and the distributional effects of these things, uh, I think, are, ought to be a big part of your conversation. Uh, I, I do think it is fair to ask all of the sectors to play, but I think you want to ask them to play in, in an equitable way as well, uh, and not with one of them saddled with a rate that's way out of sight and another one with a rate that's, that's hard to notice. Uh, so I really appreciate the chart and appreciate the comments. I think um, I think one thing that would be interesting, I, I mean, I appreciate, I heard the comments on the substitution effect. I think maybe my other comment or suggestion is, I actually think we have some pretty unhealthy behavior in the Bay Area. I just ate like 12 potato chips. That's a small <laughs> example. but. There's other less healthy behavior than that. And part of it is you know, the jobs, housing, and balance that we have in the region. So I think the other lens I hope we can bring to this is not just what the substitution effect is, but what the corrective effect on our jobs, housing, balance would be of these. Because I would be a lot more excited about a version of this that had the effect of, of, of at least metering jobs to the potential of local government and our housing industry to create enough homes for this. Um, and a lot less interested in a version of this that potentially has the opposite effect, um, not a substitution effect, but an effect that, that continues to allow rampant job growth and for the kind of fiscalization of land use at the local level that is focused on commercial development without, uh, for lack of a better word, internalizing the impacts. So, Tamika. Um, just building on Doug's bad behavior uh, comments. I, I actually think that, that that overlays this entire situation. Um, there are a lot of, this feels like an incremental approach to me, so I just want to first say thank you for putting it down on paper and giving us something to react to, but it also doesn't feel like, and maybe I, I need clarification, that th even this is enough to Mike's point about going bold. Is this enough? for the kind of impact that we're trying to have if this is only responding to the arena numbers and not necessarily to our projections of growth over time. So I'm curious about the, the willingness to do an incremental approach that might open folks up to seeing that we need more or is it going to have a chilling effect of we asked you once, this was awesome, thank you team, um, we have just enough to get by. So there's something about that that I'm not quite comfortable with and I'm trying to understand both the scale and impact and, and also if collectively, let's say we, Vikarant said we wanted something in every box to work, one or two or more of those things, do we then in totality get um, something that's more representative of the need? You know, I, I appreciate the question, Tamika, because I think it's almost visual what makes this look incremental. Uh, the idea isn't necessarily to adopt this whole page and go after, you know, 12 bites at this apple and four bites at that orange. For example, if you were to change the sales tax rate to a quarter percent, it's 800 million a year. It's a huge sum of money. Uh, and I think largely the polling that we're going to be doing will help define what our appetite level ought to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the theory is, at least with this approach, that you probably are asking each of these communities of interest for one thing, at least in one election. Uh, and uh, you want to ask them for enough to raise serious money, but not too much to break the bank, right? That's the, that's the, the trick. 
Uh, Amy. Yeah, I want to uh, second that about um, being clear about what we're trying to cover. So if, if the gap that Vikrant shared is just the current gap to meet the current arena, it doesn't cover the full deficit of need. Uh, and so it's really a partial number that covers only a portion of need, which may be what we decide we do, but I just want us to be very explicit that we're only um, impacting a slice of the problem. And one of the things that um, in some of our polling that we've done is that vo voters some t in some of the polling that we've done, when the number of what they would be taxed went up, the support went up. So that voters want to see a solution. They don't want to just see a Band-Aid. And so I feel like we just need to figure out um, what is the balancing act with all of these things. Uh, and so that's a general comment around it. And then a more specific comment is that um, around the redevelopment proposal, we do already have an action plan and a proposal and efforts that are moving with, with um, Assembly Member David Chu and et cetera around looking at redevelopment 2.0 with a 50% increment set aside for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And that was presented before CASA in July. And so um, is the idea here that only 27.5% would be for affordable housing? Can you clarify on that? And then I, one other piece is around um, the, the public land set aside. I think this, it's a really creative idea, and, and I guess I should say I love this. This is amazing and represents exactly the tools that we need to f have these conversations. So I just am, am really want to celebrate the work that, that staff have done to put this together, and thank you. Um, with the public lands, uh, it, it could have very weird unintended consequences on the state legislation. So if um, some years there may be more, la like land doesn't come in sort of a steady stream of 20 acre increments. It comes in like big strange buckets at weird times. And so I, I don't, that one seems to me like needs more thinking to figure out how, you, how that wouldn't have unintended consequences. But the, the redevelopment one, can you? I think, I think the answer for both, both proposals, Amy, is, is the same. And that's it. As Steve emphasized, there's, there is sort of an arbitrariness to what's on this sheet. Uh, we were aiming for $100 million and in, in both cases, that, that's the basic structure of what we've come up with. It doesn't mean that that figure is exactly what you would want for what we would want okay. right. for and redevelopment the, and 2.0 or, or 20 acres either. And that's and where a lot of the work needs to come. If I could say the proposal that we have in your packet today is 100%, not 50, not 27. And can I just make a comment on public land? We actually have that as a standalone policy piece for discussion later because it's on the revenue thing because free land is technically a contribution, but we have a whole think piece on the public surplus land because we do think it's an underutilized tool. So regardless of it being a revenue source, we think it's something we need to pursue. So we got about another 10 minutes for this, and I want to encourage folks to both provide comments on the sources slide, but also um, I think we're looking for some feedback on the uses side as, slide as well. Um, so maybe we can put that slide up too. I knew that would get some hands. All right, we got it. We got a one two punch here. So, All right. um, so I I just wanted to say that I definitely when I saw the public land felt that pain. And then I thought, you know yeah. what, though, I know I know that others at the table are feeling that pain on their thing. So I definitely felt what you guys said about the importance of everybody taking a hit, mm -hmm. regardless of the other comments on public land. But um, it did just elevate to me uh, the importance of bringing, you know, of bringing the compact aspect to this, and I do not know how we actually successfully do that. Obviously, some of these are moving forward already. Some are going to move forward on their own. But how do we, how do we, how do we like ensure that can, that um, that spirit of this document is actually embedded in a ongoing campaign or platform because I've, I've never actually seen that successfully done, which isn't to say that it hasn't been successfully done. I just don't know about it. But if there is any example anybody can, anybody can give of that, of everybody taking, you know, giving a little blood, that would be really helpful to see. Cool. So great comment. And I 
if you don't mind, I think we should probably try to take that up later on mm -hmm. uh, in this in this agenda when we're actually yeah. talking about kind of the compact idea. Go ahead, Derica. Great. Um, I love this because I love taxes, um, and I <laughs> and I run tax. I run these campaigns, so you I'm can really pay excited. my bill. Thank you. Um, <laughs> two comments. Um, one is just just in the category of Captain Obvious, maybe, but uh, I'll say it anyway. The, uh, as we think about the vehicles to move these, uh, you know, if there was one tax to rule them all, that'd be awesome. I imagine there's not. Um, so there's going to be multiple. And then the expenditure programs are going to be, um, pro they're going to be, the expenditures are going to be programmed based on the polling and also what we think is right, right? Which could lead to some of the P's being more popular than others. So I just want to say, Captain Obvious, we should really think about the taxes. It would, be, uh, it would be sad if the taxes that were easier to pass also had the expenditures that were easiest, and then the things that are hard are the ones that fail. So just to Captain Obvious that. And then um, I wonder on the expenditures, if preser I just feel like preservation is so important. Um, we saw 60-20, right? Just wonder if that one should be up and want to get that out there because I just feel like that is uh, something we could move on quickly if we had enough available right away. Um, so I, I actually want to just say thank you to Vikrant and the staff for this list because prior, and I have had the benefit because I'm a co-chair of seeing it multiple times and I, I really appreciated how many stones they turned over um, to come up with the list. Um, as someone who is battle scarred from Prop 1 that will be on your ballot to vote yes for near, in the near future, um, you know, I think the polling here is absolutely critical. If Sacramento has to do it, uh, we need to show them that this can pass. And I think with Prop 1, the treasurer did polling that showed support for up to $9 billion on the bond, and it really helped us get the legislature to get to two-thirds. And so I, I would not underestimate who some of our political enemies will be on this, that, and some of them are not in this room. And so I, I, the Association of Realtors comes to mind for a couple of these, and they're not a small uh, hurdle. So I would uh, encourage us to be bold and to stand together, because I think if you have one powerful enemy, it's going to be really challenging uh, in this situation. But um, I, I really like the list. I, I hope that at least three of them are real. Um, and I'd hope that more are, but if we could get three or four, it would be half a billion dollars a year that we don't have now. And so I'd want to point that out. Like, we are at zero regionally now, and we have some counties that are able to do stuff. So um, I appreciate the how big we want the loaf to be, and I hope we go bold and get two billion a year, but I wouldn't want us to not do something to get half a billion. All right. So we're going to go to Matt and then Matt. I um, want to echo the thanks to the staff and everyone who worked on these ideas. I think it's a really impressive um, array, and it's really important that there be multiple options on the table. So thanks to everybody who worked on that. Um, two, two things, one a little bit larger and one small. The larger one is, um, you know, I think the legislature is starting its process for thinking about potentially big solutions for next year. Um, I was just invited to testify at a joint Senate hearing on October 2nd. And um, so it would be great to get a sense of what could be discussed in an exploratory level with the legislature at this early stage, uh, either on my own or uh, referencing others. The second is that the um, preservation piece, I'd just like a clarification from what the intent is. There's nothing that specifically talks about acquisition or rehabilitation uses, but I'm assuming that, that that was intended to be part of that. Great. Thank you. So I would add an, an amen for um, everything that's been said so far in terms of very much appreciating having all of these options on the table to help get us at, at least towards that $1.68 billion annual uh, gap that we have. Uh, and, and to say a particular word of praise for some of these concepts that, um, that link the overall Plan Bay Area vision with our, with our focused housing discussion here around um, uh, the prioritizing the, the geographies um, that are most important, the, uh, the, the VMT concept, the, the transportation priority area concept that, that help us create 
rewards for uh, the right development in the right places. And I think the, that the more we're bringing in that theme throughout this process, uh, the more successful we'll be uh, in, in achieving our, the, the more comprehensive set of goals that, that hug and embrace the, the CASA set of goals. So we've got time for maybe two more brief comments, maybe one long one. Um, and if, go ahead, Jennifer. Um, also, appreciations, thank you. I don't like taxes as much as Derica, so. Um, just wanted to flag also for the analysis piece what um, the cost savings are related to some of these things. So, um, and then what that, you know, in terms of the percentage breakdown. So the, the thing I'm most familiar with, for example, is on the tenant protection side where New York and San Francisco have done studies in the New York case, which is about the scale of we're talking about in the Bay Area, it's a $300 million a year savings compared to a, a much smaller cost for some of the legal programs. So I'd also be curious to see how that plays out given in this scenario and how that then suggests what the different um, percentages breakdown should be. Um, and then the other question I have, which is maybe a little too esoteric, but are there also uh, existing like, are there ways in which we can think about reducing barriers to revenue, not necessarily introducing new revenue mechanisms, but what are other barriers? The obvious one to me is the Prop 13 stuff, but no one has said it today. Um, maybe that's not what we want to say. Maybe there are other ones, and those who are tax experts can tell us, but are there other approaches to also kind of expanding existing pools maybe is the way to think about it. So once we have all this money, um, there needs to be a place to hold some of it. And Heather Hood from Enterprise is going to give us a fairly brief presentation on a regional housing trust fund concept. Mary, did you want to say something before? Yeah, I thought there should be some recognition for, don't ask me how you do this, for areas that have already stepped up, such as Alameda County, Oakland, all the local bond cities that are enacting bond issues now, um, you know, Santa Clara County, and also double and raise, and again, I don't know how you do this, Doug, but looking at the unbridled job creation going on in San Francisco, and they build Salesforce, tower but never kick in extra money to make BART bigger or roads bigger or add bridges and it's just uh, it's distorting the whole Bay Area. You can't blame it all on San Francisco but it's just kind of a glaring example. Uh, and anyway, it would be nice to take that into consideration and again take somebody smarter than me to figure it out. Good luck. Oh, thank you and thanks for all these comments. Um, Ken, I'm just looking at the agenda, and I didn't see a presentation on the regional housing fund. So it's actually it's in small type right there. Ah, oh. it's there. You just have to look the, the, really. Close. You got me with the fine print. <laughs> Gets the best of us. Okay. Um, is this quick? It is very quick. All right. Yes. So um, five minutes on the regional housing fund, and then we're going to need to move on. All right. All right. Hi, folks. Um, we're having a little technical difficulty with the PowerPoint, but no reason we can't just get started. Um, I'm going to talk about some, you know, considerations for creating a regional housing trust fund, uh, sort of as assuming that we want to do it. Oh, no, that's an old one. That's, a, that's about a different topic. Um, here's what it looks like. So... I'll assert that the local sources and systems that we've got so far are insufficient. Whether we're talking about 1.6 billion or two or three billion, um, we are going to need a place for those resources to go. Um, and so a regional housing trust fund is a kind of mechanism that helps us sort of get beyond those administrative and legislative barriers that we're so fettered by in delivering these housing solutions. And Um, and if we think of those different sources as ingredients, um, then we can think about where do they go? How do we cook them up into being something more than just themselves? So, um, oh good, here it is. 
Um, so I, I, I know it's just about lunchtime, so I'm, I'm getting you used to the idea right here. Housing trust funds are not a new idea. There are 700 of them that already exist in this country. There are about 50 in the state of California, and they're typically funded with a major one or two public sources. So if ours was funded by four or five, that's just terrific. The matter, what matters is the dollar amount and where, how they get distributed in our thinking. So let's just think about maybe this would be a place for some of those fallow funds that exist in the local jurisdictions, maybe even here at MTC, the funds that already are used like HIP or um, the TPA incentive dollars, they could be put there. Um, those major sources, and then in some places, some resources, some of the Housing Trust Fund is held back to do investment, to grow the resources. And if there are loans being made, there's income from those interests. So you put that all in one place and sort of uh, create a soup. Um, um, there are examples of, of housing trust funds that do all of that. Um, I wanted to point out one thing that would be a new ball game for us, which is that there's no such thing as a trust fund that's the size that we're talking about. So we don't have a best practice. So once again, the Bay Area would have to be out there on that cutting edge. You know, um, NPH and Enterprise uh, brought together a, about a dozen experts and brought somebody who knows a lot about how these um, trust funds work around the country from the Center for Community Change about a couple months ago and had a really hearty conversations and tackled um, these, um, what I wanted to talk about is um, how the resources would be deployed throughout the region to support all of the three Ps and ensure some equity um, is, is geographic, and then who would administer the funds. So this is just a sketch, a Sunday morning, early morning on a plane uh, sketch um, that we could right size proportionally later. But let's think about making sure that um, the trust fund would serve the whole region by having some of those resources returned to source and some of them shared across the region. Now what Ken presented was that 10% of them would return to source. We can debate that sort of um, proportionality later. But per and some of the resources would be ne needed for operations. Now if you start to layer in conceptually that some resources would be used for protections. Heather, so, can you define return to source in case people don't understand oh, what that sure. means? Oh, sure, yeah. The Mountain View um, linkage fees get into the Regional Housing Trust Fund, and some of them are insured to go back to uses in Mountain View, and some of them are shared across the region, and so on, throughout our jurisdictions. So layer into this concept that also there would be these um, proportions that uh, Ken started to talk about, these are just in, in quarters, um, for protections, preservation, and production. I'd argue that we'd also need something like innovations. You know, two years ago, we didn't know scooters were gonna take over our city streets, right? So we don't know what the housing innovations are gonna be in the future, and we're gonna need that flexibility. So that gets built in as well. So, um, it remains to be answered by an attorney we need to do a lot more mm -hmm. digging to understand what the best place is to um, situate such a fund. Um, it could be in a joint powers authority, such as B the Bay Area Toll Authority. It could be uh, an account simply here at MTC and governed with MTC and ABAG once they're fully merged. It could be with the C CDFI and so on. You know, I just was in Seattle asking them how they're doing it this past Monday, because they're going to do something very similar. And they're giving themselves two years and a quarter million dollars to have those hearty conversations to figure this stuff out. So the next steps would be to start to do that um, and, um, and, and figure out you know, the, that situation question, the governance question, the right sizing of everything. But not, not to be deterred. This has been done before, just not quite as bold as we need to be. That's it. Thank you, Heather. So unfortunately, we don't have the time to kind of dig into this right now, but I think it'd be helpful for everybody to kind of hold this concept in the back of their minds as we go through uh, the rest of the day as kind of maybe an organizing uh, uh, vehicle for uh, the various things that we're discussing. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Denise and Jennifer, who are going to 
go over the geography discussion with us. Frank, can I, could, can I just ask one quick question based on, I know I'm, I'm cutting into Denise's time, but Heather, thank you for that. Hi. Um, I think what will be a fun challenge to work through, and I'm sure you've thought of this um, among many, is the extent to which some of this money plays with, um, is like paired up with other money. So whether it's HCD or TCAC, um, um, and then, and, or Veterans Affairs, like different um, departments with different monies that have their own policy desires, um, knowing that um, there could be conflicts of priorities um, when you have more governmental entities administering dollars. Yes. Like everyone who administers dollars wants their policies to supersede. Um, and so mixing pots from different departments always gets fun and challenging. So I know you thought of that, but just a big thing to highlight. It's going to be a challenge. But we have to figure out how to get it to be flexible enough to really work. I it's agree. just built, got to be built in. Yeah. All right. Hello, friends. Wow. I didn't see how many people were in the room. Okay, now I'm nervous. Oh, okay. Um, here we are, we're gonna dive into the policy package, um, but in order to do that, we need to set um, kind of a context around the application of some of these policies. For many months, um, several of us have been meeting in robust conversation about how we can um, designate policies that have particular applications in particular places. Um, and that's what we're calling the geography of inclusion. Uh, as Fred said earlier, we know that not all places are the same, no one size fits all, and yet um, we all need to, we, every place needs to figure out how to do its part. So um, what we are gonna, and I wanna just thank those who were really involved in this, Denise, Jonathan, Thank you, Asen, Will, Vikrant was part of some of these conversations. Uh, many, who else? Pedro, oh my God, Pedro, thank you, you saved us. Pedro, a shepherd of this along, Fernando. Uh, there were a lot of us working on this and we didn't agree, but we have come to some kind of tentative agreement proposal that we now want your input on. We have reached our limit. So, um, what you're going to see in the packet uh, called the Geography of Inclusion is basically an explanation of our rationale for why this approach seems appropriate to, in particular around um, some of the production policies. Um, and can you put up the map? We worked closely with um, the Turner Center uh, and the UC Berkeley team to identify uh, uh, data sources and maps that would help us determine um, where there are vulnerable communities where um, accelerating market rate production would contribute to the ongoing gentrification and displacement of these communities, communities where there has been historic um, segregation, redlining, and disinvestment and where we wanted to create a way of those communities participating and engaging in the market rate production policies, but at their pace, and in a way that they could actually have more ownership and say over how that rolls out in their communities. Um, and as a way to kind of, you know, try to roll back history a little bit. Um, are the maps? They're frozen. They're frozen, okay. So imagine the Bay Area, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, the maps are in your packet, so if you can take a look at them, um, it would be nice to see them all together, but they're in your packet. Uh, we have used the maps that were generated um, by ABAG slash MTC, the Communities of Concerns map from 2013, um, because that's about the point in which the housing crisis really started heating up and where communities, um, there was more of a clear idea of where vulnerable communities were located. Um, 
Now, for some of us, this does not tell the whole story, so we want some feedback about that, about is this the right map? Um, but nonetheless, that's where we are now. So I'm going to pass it on to Denise, um, who's going to kind of walk through what the policies are. Oh, before she get, I do that. Um, so the purpose of the mapping project is to identify where are the communities that can, um, under a certain set of proposals, get more time to do some planning so that they can make decisions about um, opting in or out of the development proposals and they would get a certain period of time by which to make some of those decisions. So we have it, it four to five years or thereabouts. And in addition, kind of part of the revenue conversation in this, we would want to find ways in which we could support them being able to have a planning process. Um, so again, this is about creating some protections or, or some staying power around communities that are vulnerable to displacement, creating spaces in which they can have a say over the kind of development in their communities because of historic marginalization, and also um, still be part of the larger conversation about the three Ps um, that are happening at the region. So I, I also wanted to put this note. Um, Jennifer said the word opt out, which you know, if you're a developer, you think that means no no build zone. So I wanted to add a layer of color and tie it in with what we discussed before under money. Casa's trying to create a shared pain for collective gain model to to stop the tragedy of the commons that currently dominates our balkanized fights over housing. So in order to do that we need to understand that housing production in, in certain forms needs to happen everywhere. And so in a di by recognizing that different, not all housing is made the same, Jonathan and I talked previously about not all housing costs the same to build. Not all housing is built by the same sectors of the housing industry. And so there are some forms of market rate housing that are naturally less costly to build and that tend because they tend to be smaller, uh, cost less to rent or, or to own. So this geography proposal understands that not all development is made equally, and yet creating inclusion in every neighborhood, which I believe is part of the goal of CASA, means over changing historic patterns of discrimination and redlining, but also creating a path forward in disadvantaged communities or communities that have been neglected to find a way forward for small businesses or small homeowners to, uh, to be able to create economic opportunity and opportunities for community members to live in that community over time. So, because what we have now is once pretty much a, an African-American family moves out of the house they're in now or the apartment they're in now, they leave the central part of the region. That was the article in the Chronicle this morning uh, in the you know, front page section. So if we're going to unwind that, we need to allow some amount of more naturally affordable growth to occur in every part of the Bay Area. And not all new housing should be concentrated geographically on the rail system lines that was the focus of planned Bay Area. Um, when many of those rail lines were built through the middle of historic black and brown communities and low income communities. So how do we in this, sh this collective inclusive shared gain model find a way forward on, on housing issues that are less likely to cause displacement and gentrification and also allow there to be a natural increase in supply. So now we finally have our table up. Um, when you take that, these concepts to the notion of zoning, and to the CASA compact that we'll talk about next, right? We have a list of 15-ish, 16 policies in your packet that we think we want to advance subject to conversation. How would those interact with the geography conversation? So the, the first principle is some kinds of land uses just shouldn't be targeted for upzoning because you'll never get them back, mobile homes and SROs. If, those, if a site is in a, an upzone or a changed land use zone area, those sites shouldn't be eligible because that's just a level of affordability and a product type that is unlikely to be recreated. Second notion is that in every neighborhood in the Bay Area, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, should be allowed on every single family lot 
one ADU plus a junior ADU. That was the Ting ADU bill that will hopefully be reintroduced in the next session to create inclusive zoning on every block in every neighborhood in the region at a very small scale level. Um, in multifamily lots, regardless of their size, in existing unused spaces, units should be able to be added. So San Francisco does that, Arlington, Virginia does that. It's a way of adding density without looking at the world any differently. Um, for sites along transit corridors where we've had a lot of conversations as a region about upzoning on transit, um, and also the idea of some of the committees came up with about rezoning on transit or rezoning commercial sites for housing, those, are, those ideas have been combined with all of these ideas to say, okay, in that half mile radius that's maybe a TPA, a transit priority area, we collectively agree that a certain minimum amount of development should be allowed at these missing middle densities, including on sites that are now zoned commercial or that are used in institutional land uses. They should just have a housing overlay and a minimum density overlay in that half mile radius. And then on the transit corridor itself, to be defined, you could go up higher. You could go to 75 feet. That, that's the current conversation. Um, but the communities of concern that are on the map that we will, that's in your packet would be able to opt out of that increase in density above the missing middle ambient zoning height. Does everyone follow that more or less? Okay. Um, and 100% affordable housing could not be opted out of up to the 75-foot limit. So you're really only talking about big market rate buildings being opted out of while the planning period occurs. There's a lot more weeds in there, and I don't want to take time to explain them now, but I think you get the general idea that this was an attempt to, un to acknowledge that housing growth is important in every neighborhood in a way that suits each neighborhood and creates inclusion everywhere. So questions? I think we'll take clarifying questions and some brief comments because we have about five minutes left before, but this is going to be essential to understanding some of the policy proposals um, would have that have a lot more detail. So if there's clarifying comments, please let us know. Yeah, this is a clarifying question. Could you just help me unpack a little bit the large cell? So the on transit quarters, I think what I understood is a certain amount of stuff would happen regardless of whether it's a community of concern, like the, the housing overlay in commercial districts, and there'd be a certain base amount of density for housing that would be, for lack of a better word, imposed on transit corridors, but the height bump was what would differentiate communities of concern for other communities. Did I get that right? I think people are either confused or excited. <laughs> Go ahead. Stunned at the brilliance. <laughs> Appreciative of all of the, the work that has gone into this so far and, and, and interested to see uh, some, of, some of the details uh, fleshed out around uh, areas immediately adjacent to the transit corridor and things like that. Um, on your very first box, it seems like one of the um, untapped opportunities we have in the Bay Area or, or infrequently tapped is to be able to um, replace mobile home parks with uh, 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 permanently affordable housing that can get significantly higher and better densities. I just suggest that as a, uh, as a caveat as we think about um, making, making an allowance for well, that. Well, then that would be at discretion of the local jurisdiction to do that, right? This is more of a saying like, there's nothing in here that says local jurisdictions can't do something of that nature. This is not, this is just more of like a, there isn't an expectation that that would be the case. It's like a state minimum overlay. Right. Like a housing overlay zone, it means housing's overlaid. This would be a housing overlay in that half mile radius. It, we didn't get into it, but in a community that has already adopted a plan that has a higher density, for example, mm -hmm. um, you, you would not opt out of your own plan even if you are in a yep. census tract that is of concern. If the community's already done the planning and the land use planning and has a plan, you should follow your plan, follow your zoning. This is for communities that have had no planning resources, um, that often are unresourced communities for a reason, and this gives them opportunity to have voice and agency and think about their future 
um, in, an, in an inclusive way rather than you know, just suffering the impact of displacement and zoning changes that we think are good for climate change but may have unintended consequences. So, so can I make perhaps a it relates to the final box where, where, where it's saying 100% affordable housing projects uh, uh, can't, be, can't have certain restrictions imposed upon them for heights, et cetera, that that would then relate to your, your SRO conversions that if a jurisdiction is providing that a jurisdiction couldn't have restrictive zoning in those particular places. That's the only question. This is great. I, I, Ann Fryman in the back and Her, Senator Wiener, and staff Amy, person. So I wanna, and you've got Amy and, and Linda here too. Oh, and Adi. Ann, can you come forward so we can hear you and catch a mic? Great. Um, I just wanted to say, again, a thanks to the team and especially to Pedro Galval from my staff who um, put in an enormous amount of work to, to really pull so many threads together. Uh, Pedro? <laughs> wave, You're a hero! <laughs> All right. He's too modest. But um, so... <laughs> So I should, I should know this because Pedro has prepped me, so this is no reflection on him, it's on me. <laughs> but um, can you clarify why you're making a distinction between uh, height limits and density limits and, or, or the height limit versus no density limit? Because without the, because the density is associated, if you pack everybody in, you can get a lot of tiny homes or, or studios or uh, housing for single people rather than families and there are tensions around uh, how to provide family-sized housing. So can you just remind me what I should I think it? those are, you remember in any one of these deep dives, there are gonna be things that you talk about in shorthand that need to be fully developed. So I, I think that the 36 foot height limit, 75% lot coverage, no parking, you no know, setback, that was sort of shorthand for, we think we know what we mean, but we know we need to nuance it further. Just as another example, uh, Portland, Oregon is rezoning their single family neighborhoods to do exactly this, exactly this. And they have some additional standards we didn't think of, like maximum unit size and minimum unit size. So, so we may, in the next round, be adding that kind of granularity. It, it just was a matter of we just didn't have time to get to it because we were dealing with these much broader issues which were hard to get our arms around. Okay, Linda, then so, Adi, then Derica. So the, um, just purely by accident, I stumbled upon a concept called the conservation zone in Arlington, Virginia. That is really a, a local designation that Arlington worked very hard to parse that, that creates zones where they're trying to conserve affordable housing, missing middle, naturally occurring, and it's kind of like a reverse redevelopment area. I would I would strongly recommend that we take a look at this this policy. They've thought it all through, uh, in a lot of detail around how resources would go here, how it would help preserve, how it would help create. It, it was um, quite interesting to read and fairly well evolved. And their state law may be different than our state law. I'm sure it is, but there may be some stuff there that could really help us formulate this in a way that makes sense. Um, so I would commend you to that uh, website. It's quite good. Thank you. Uh, I think just two things that I'm struggling with. One is, um, so if I understand it, 36-foot um, height limits along transit corridors and impacted or um, impacted communities, or however that's defined. Um, you know, I, I actually Fernando and I had a great meeting about this this morning. I struggle with the the trade-off between building height and density near transit, maximizing extractions to still promote feasibility with a, low, a very low density, cheap product. Um, and because we, when we build, we kind of lose that site forever. Um, is that, am I, I think misunderstanding it's really important. that? I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I also would recommend you look at the, um, 
the maps uh, to kind of correlate because it's not every it's not every like there don't there's not a direct correlation between the transit location and the communities that might be of concern. And in many of the places where the communities, there is a concern, they're already zoned way past this. Yeah, um, so, so I think it's also just important to kind of notif notice some of that. Um, <laughs> so the up zoning areas, if this is what we did, right, it's all subject to discussion, would be these circles, these half mile radius. <coughs> this is a TPA map, that's what the yellow circle is. So all of these areas would receive missing middle zoning overlay. Some of them may already have zoning that dense, some of them may not. Um, in the pink areas where there's an intersection of the identified areas that could be eligible for the opt-out of the zoning change on transit, you'll notice, for example, most of East Palo Alto is out of the TPA. So it's, it doesn't matter. Um, they would all get the ability to have ADUs, which they don't maybe currently have today. Um, in much of the area around Foster City that's lowering, so, and the, the two thresholds were high levels of poverty, high levels of non-white households. Those were the two screens. So if you'll notice, most of the TPAs in the Bay Area are not these places of concern by sort of land area, which means you're bringing in inclusion into places where if it's zoned single family today, it will be zoned more inclusively tomorrow. And in the communities of concern, say a good deal of Oakland, all of downtown Oakland already has high density zoning on transit, supported by their plans. So that would not be changed. Okay. Okay. So, it, so we're really talking about what happens in these subsets. You're in a TPA and you're in a, an area of concern, mm -hmm. and only those places are opting out to give them so, some breathing room to plan. Okay. Yeah. Derica. Really quick, you guys are superheroes for this conversation. Um, it's really exciting. Uh, the One of the things that I think was exciting about h how you all did this is that there was an assumption, an explicit assumption, that strong tenant protections and proposals like around one-to-one -one replacement and no net loss, though it's hard and complicated, um, make this easier and that are important to make this work. So thank you for that. Um, also, just want to emphasize something you said, but the community planning processes, for it to be effective, it's got to be invested in, um, and it has to be funded. So you said it, but I just want to say that is the game changer. That's the thing that needs to be unlocked. Right. So, yeah, I, I appreciate you pointing that, because the assumption we made here was that the proposals around the tenant protections were uh, are everywhere, um, and so that's like baseline and then the nuancing of how the production rolls out um, is on top of that. Yeah, yeah, we didn't say it because we're tired and we've been talking about this forever, so we think everyone knows everything we know. But our, pr our premise was all costs of policies apply everywhere, whatever we decide they are, um, except these particular zoning increases in these sensitive places in something like a TPA, right? So everything is everywhere. Tenant protections are everywhere. Preservation is everywhere. Um, all the other land use modifications and so forth are everywhere. So we are all in this together, sharing the pain <laughs> and also the collective gain unless you're one of these places. So, so I wanna, uh, oh. So. We maybe two more, and then we're going to really have to move on. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Tamika, Tamika, well, Jackie. I'll, I'll just be brief. I, I'll echo thanks. Thank you. This is exactly what I feel like has been missing from the conversation. I just wanted to echo something Derek has said, which is not only that the community planning processes are funded, but the language we're using is suggesting, when you say opt out, it actually is suggesting both exclusion and delay. So in my mind, I want to be clear that we are not only um, prioritizing these by, by giving folks time, but then we're proactively in tandem engaging folks in capacity building to actually do constructive community planning that is going to benefit them, them and their communities. 
<clears throat> and that's basically what I wanted to follow up on. It just seemed like they're just being left behind more so as all the re other resources get sucked up by communities of opportunity. Um, and I would add as um, potentially as another consideration for future funding is some sort of neighborhood or community preferences uh, for affordable housing. Those that, are really helpful comments. That those comments. get built in. Uh, I think, you know, when you're running, running, running to put together so a lot of complicated information that hasn't really, that with a story that's never really been well told, you, you focus on some things. And then when you roll it out, people are like, oh, yeah, that story makes sense. And then they want to talk about the messaging. So please talk about the messaging because you're right. It was not meant to exclude and help, like help us with that because we're not seeing it now. Doug, and then we'll move. It's more just a question for future clarification. Like, I think it's great that we say that all of the protections touch everything. And I guess unclear to me and probably a meta question is how does that happen? Um, so. Well, that's a great segue, Doug. Like exactly. reading our minds. Yeah. Yes. Thank Perfect. you, Doug. So we want to spend the next hour and 20 minutes or so uh, digging into the the package of proposals and what we are uh, calling the compact. And we just want to spend a little bit of time uh, teeing this up for uh, you all and then um, get uh, to the next piece of work. Um, just starting uh, with a little bit of kind of reminder of kind of vision and, and where we are. Um, you know, we went into this process uh, inviting uh, you into this very specifically with the notion that we wanted to uh, invite people who agreed that there was a problem uh, but didn't agree on the solution. Uh, and so uh, what we've been trying to drive you to uh, is a, a consensus around a higher common denominator uh, than we've had before uh, around these issues and to have that conversation be guided by a regional frame. Uh, and there are a few principles that we have been holding with us as co-chairs throughout all of this. One was that we wanted to uh, create a situation that promoted compromise and uh, discouraged us from staying in our silos. Uh, the other is the notion that we are literally in a state of emergency and we go down uh, the path that we are currently going down at our own peril collectively. Uh, and that, and this has been a theme already, that every sector and every uh, community both needs to participate and benefit from this, uh, but also share in some of the pain. Uh, so that's really uh, how we've been thinking about this. And you can go to the next slide. Um, you've seen these goals before. I won't go over all of them, but you know we are looking for significant systemic shifts. We're looking for when to get wins and must-haves for every, most of the constituencies around the table. Uh, we want to guide this to a place where we're pledging to work together uh, on moving this stuff over uh, the finish line, uh, which means that they're going to be for each one of you all positives and negatives that are associated with this uh, package. And if I, you know, and Mike said this a little bit earlier, we want to be bold. Uh, we want to incorporate best practices. I just want to say one more thing before I turn it um, over to the work group moderators to kind of get into a little bit more detail, which is kind of where we are, which is the uh, left-hand side of this box. Um, and I won't go over where we've been. Um, but really, um, what we're looking for from this meeting uh, and the next steering committee meeting uh, is two things. One is an overall sense of whether or not this feels like, based on all of our conversations, the right package, or at least close to it. Uh, and the second piece being, um, do we have or have we identified the right points of further negotiation uh, that need to take place before finalizing this package? And you'll get more detail on that in a minute. So. At this point, uh, what we want to have, kind of leaving these next two meetings, is both those two senses and we want to assemble a smaller group that includes both technical and steering committee meeting, uh, members to actually start to hash out those negotiating points that are still outstanding. 
uh, for the items. Uh, and so what we want to do is kind of frame up a small group discussion for you. Um, and just for members of the public who are here, um, it would be helpful if you all could have some discussion as well. Uh, because what we're going to do after the small group discussions of the technical committee is actually go to public comment so that we can hear from members of the public who are here before we enter into the larger group discussion and tackle these questions um, around whether we have the right stuff on the table and whether we have the right negotiating points. Um, and so I, is it Denise and Jennifer, are you all back up again? Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'll invite those two back up, the dynamic duo. All right, all right. Um, to kind of go over at a real high level um, uh, what we have here and what we want to uh, engage you in. And the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to them, we have been, as we've gone through all the action plans, very much kind of in the weeds and in the trees um, throughout all this. And today what we're looking for from you is much more of a forest-oriented conversation. So we really want you, as kind of uh, Mike described a little bit earlier about kind of where he does his best thinking, at that 30,000-foot level. Um, not necessarily digging into all the gory details of each and every one of these action proposals right now. Go ahead. Okay. We're a little slap happy right now because uh, we've been working on this for the past two weekends, through the weekends. So <laughs> forgive us if we're a little disorganized in the presentation. Um, okay, so in your packet, you're going to see slightly more detailed set of uh, term sheets is what we're calling them. Um, as Fred said, highlighting what are the pinch points or the negotiation points. So we're just going to quickly run through the draft proposal um, for what a compact might include. So um, just cause for eviction, protection policy, um, an anti-gouging cap, anti-rent gouging cap, previously called rent stabilization, we're now talking about as anti-rent gouging cap, and also the right to legal counsel are all the three specifically uh, protection policies that you will find in your proposal. Do I need to say more than that, Fred? No. No, right? Because yeah. we're going to get in the small group, no, and then no we're going to tear it up. And okay, yeah. great. Um, other. So uh, actually, Linda's going to go next. Just as a framing concept, the the goal of this list was to pull all the 50 action plans, there were 50 of them, into a thing you could get on one page. Many of these items address several Ps and are amalgams of several action plans, like you saw in the, the upzone housing overlay on transit. It was like two or three action plans smushed together into one policy. So all of these reflect trying to be inclusive of the three Ps when possible, not overruling a P or making another P impossible to achieve, and also um, doing our best when possible to use existing government agencies and staffing to accomplish objectives by pruning or shaping or setting uniform regional standards and laws so that instead of being balkanized into every different city and county with its own way of doing things, its own land use standards, its own rules, its own fees, we're floating above that to create regional standards that level the playing field so everybody is treated fairly and in a uniform way across the three Ps. All right, so number four is to amend housing element law and RENA allocation to enhance preservation, uh, Im improve the ability to serve the missing middle, uh, and to make sure you have sites that are actually feasible to build on. Um, this is both a potential policy, potential state law change, and or a potential tactic. It could be a regulatory change when it comes to housing element. So we've sort of walked through what those choices might be in the fact sheet. Uh, no net loss really means that we're trying not to lose ground on the number of affordable housing units that we have. Uh, I wrote this page, uh, and I think the question here is where would no net loss come into play? Would it, I doubt it would be one big statewide piece of legislation, but where might it overlay and how is really the question that I think um, we're trying to grapple with. Um, we already heard about money from Vikran, uh, and um, 
Uh, seven, promote public land for affordable housing. We've already talked about. We think that's a, a absolutely critical. Um, and then eight is redevelopment 2.0. And you can thank Leslie for that. So I will hand that. Who gets it next? Denise. Um, so we're now going to move into sort of the land use policies from, um, from others. And in this arena, um, we have, and again, these are all old action plans. One of them is that we need to have some uniformity around standards and administration of inclusionary zoning so that it works to both create affordable housing and allow market rate housing that provides that affordable housing stream rather than effectively becoming a new kind of growth control. Remove barriers to ADU, we've talked a lot about. Um, on the inclusionary, we have a lot of work to do, by the way. So there are a lot of details on the sheet that are sort of left TBD, and, and that's going to be a work product for the coming 30 days. Um, number 11, align and improve density bonus and inclusionary zoning. The state has three different bodies of law, Mitigation Fee Act, the Density Bonus Law, and now the Palmer Fix. So some cities are looking at three separate revenue streams, if you will, for affordable housing as if they were distinctive and additive, which again has the effect of suppressing housing construction. So let's true those up. On-site affordable is the goal, and more of it is the goal. So how do we true it up so they don't become preventative? Um, we talked about how to create a fair process in every city with some modest amendments to the Permit Streamlining Act a statutory CEQA exemption only for small projects, less than 20 units or less, so that the notion is, if you're in an urbanized area in the nine county Bay Area, you should be processing that project quickly without CEQA causing delay. And by quickly, we said six months. For projects larger than that, uh, we have another streamlining mechanism under CEQA, which I'll get to in a minute. And then lock fees, rules, et cetera, at project application completion so the bar is not constantly rising every time you go to a new hearing. And community what? And community benefits. And community benefits get locked at that time as well. Um, and this is only for zoning compliant projects. We're only talking about uniform, streamlined, fair practices for things that are already consistent with local zoning. Cap impact fees, we've talked about the notion is, again, to have just reasonable limits on impact fees across the region so some cities aren't struggling to get more housing and keeping their impact fees under control while other cities use impact fees as both a way to pay for needed services, but it also is an effective barrier, therefore, to both affordable and market rate housing. Uh, minimum state zoning near transit, we talked about already in the geography conversation. Product defect liability, I'm going to hand it over to Derica. I'm just going to read it. Modify product liability for condominiums. We've heard this is a problem. We want to make it easier to get insured. Uh, see, see, this has a basic support. Um, uh, new revenue to cities to build housing. Did you do streamlining? Did you do SB 35? I skipped and that how one. do you make, uh, and, and that whole discussion is how do we use the state streamlining tool, SB 35, and make it work? Um, and include labor standards, affordability, but also give new tools so more projects take that piece of legislation up and use it. That's the package. Really, we want to get to the discussion. Cool. Can, Fred, can I just make one statement? Sure. Um, when, when we came up with this number, this 17, there were, a, some of them were, are, were combined, but some of them that you might not see here, I just wanted to make sure that the, we, everyone knows they weren't, they're not lost. I think what we really uh, want to do is, for many of those, like data uh, collection, some of the ideas that we had about having a rent registry or other things like that, that they would be still part of this package, but maybe part of uh, the regional agency. Is that, did you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, that's what Leslie said. There, there were a lot of great ideas. I don't need a mic. I don't need no stinking mic. Um, there were a lot of great ideas, 50 ideas, all of them good, all of them equally meritorious, cannot do 50 things in, in a single moment. So, um, but if we create a new regional housing entity that has ongoing funding and at least some ongoing, you know, modeling, best practices, providing technical assistance, um, perhaps monitoring the rollout of all of these cost of action plans to see what we didn't think of. This is a complex policy area and there will be unintended consequences or things we didn't think of. 
So some place for this to reside over the next 20 or 30 years so that CASA doesn't end in January. It continues on as CASA 2.0. And we won't be co-chairing for 30 years. Yeah. Let's make that. <laughs> in this regional housing entity. So ideas that we couldn't think of, an, and again, to go back to the framing criteria, where we could think of an intervention that was kind of a surgical amendment to existing bodies of law or a standard, a new rule or law that existing agencies could easily be held to, that's what we elevated to the top. If it's an ongoing program of education and funding and resourcing and things that, that can't just happen with a one-stop shop approach, then we are imagining that that ongoing role needs to reside in this regional agency. So it, it both has a funding component, but also an ongoing programming best practice um, monitoring component to make sure that these interventions work as were intended and if there are unintended or things we just didn't think about that they have a place to go to be addressed so we don't fall back into our silos again when this process ends and go back to the balkanized way of, of behaving as a region. In order to fix a 40-year problem you need a 40-year solution CASA 2.0 in the Regional Housing Agency is where all of those other ideas that you didn't see elevated, we think, should go. Great. Were you all going to do the... I thought you didn't want us to not. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want you to do the details, but yeah. just if you could go one more slide. Oh, oh. yeah. Just to give people right. a sense of the structure of these. Oh, yeah. All right, so how to read the short-term sheet. So each one, you'll see a brief description of the policy proposal um, and its desired impact. These are, of course, a very abbreviated versions. Um, the suggestion as, as to what scale this should apply. Um, existing models, if there are any, where we can find more resources. Um, and references, and this, the references are related to pre prior proposals that have been introduced into CASA. So if you are like me and have six binders sitting on your desk, you can go to your binder of CASA policy 1.4 and you can find the more detailed version. Um, and then the negotiating points. So these are places where we have worked really hard to get to some levels of agreement, but we can't get, we haven't been able to get to agreement on lots of things. Um, and so these are the points of disagreement or further negotiation or refinement that needs to happen. Um, so the, um, they're, they're, we did our best to identify all of those. You may find others um, as you discuss in your small group or as you think about this over the next month. Um, but we want to keep making note of that and raising those to the light so we can address them. So I, I would also point out that when we're looking at um, the how, uh, we often say legislation applied to the nine county Bay Area, which may actually be harder than applying it to the entire state of California. So uh, there are places there where we would appreciate your feedback on this shouldn't just be this confined or this is easier to do in this way or um, some things where you might do a regulatory incentive for localities that would be easier in the near term to get some adoption rather than wait for 17 new pieces of legislation or one piece of legislation for the nine Bay Area counties. So we're really interested in kind of where we can get closer agreement in the near term and where you think the lift is heavier, particularly for any group you might represent. Great. So um, Autumn, I'd like you to kind of walk everybody through the logistics of the small group. But before doing that, I think I can speak for everybody uh, when I say thank you to these four women uh, who have been uh, doing fabulous uh, Herculean work. Thanks, Fred. So uh, as you've heard, we are going to break into small group discussions. We're a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to suggest that we do 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Um, and so there's going to be seven groups, one led by each of the co-chairs or moderators. And audience members, we haven't forgotten about you. Vikrant and, and Ken and I are going to lead small group conversations with the audience at the same time. And then what happens afterwards, as Fred already mentioned, is that we're going to do public comment immediately after the small group. So you don't need to give your public comment to us. We're really here to answer questions for you. Uh, and then we'll have the large group discussion. So um, there's seven groups, and I'm just going to quickly run through them. Um, so with Mike is going to be Tamika, Ken, and Rich. With Leslie is going to be Scott, 
Amy Inglis and uh, and just Scott and Amy Inglis. And with Fred is going to be Andreas. We're actually just made some last minute changes. I apologize because two people just have to leave. I understand, Michelle, you're leaving. Is that correct? Oh, 130. Oh, you can participate. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So in Fred's group, we're going to have Andreas and Michelle and Matt Vanderschleis. Uh, Denise's group is going to be uh, Amy, uh, Amy Fishman, uh, Josh, and Caitlin. Uh, Jennifer Martinez's group is going to have Bob Glover, Jackie, uh, and Matt Schwartz. Uh, Derica will have Doug, Lynn, and Abby. And Linda will have Randy, Ophelia, and Adi. And Jonathan, we're going to put you with Leslie. Leslie's group. <laughs> Sorry, he came in late. Okay. Uh, does everybody know where they're supposed to be? If I didn't tell you, say your name, please tell me now. Okay. Oh, uh, yes. So just, sorry, just to clarify what we're doing, this is your opportunity. The, the person who's leading your group is going to walk you through the, each of these term sheets. So this is your opportunity to, to hear a little bit more detail about each of the 17 ideas and talk about negotiating points. Sorry, go ahead, Fred. So, no, we're not going to walk you through each of these. Yeah. Um, what we want to do is warm you up for the large group discussion. So really what we want you to do is have a conversation about the 17, also have a conversation around uh, whether you think these are kind of the right, right negotiating points. So we're not going to walk you through it. The, actually, the intent was to rather than walk you through it, have you kind of try to absorb this in smaller groups so that we can then have a more robust, large conversation. That clear? All right. <laughs> Abby Carlin, could you bring up the compact slide again, just the single slide, so people can look at it while they shuffle? Thanks. So as uh, everybody reassembles, I, Ken, are you going to manage public comment? Or do we have cards? Can you hear me? Yes. We do have cards, uh, and we'll first uh, do the general public comments. So these are public comments on everything that has been talked about today. And then as part of the report out structure, uh, there were three groups that met, and we'll be representing those, those groups after the general public comments. Okay. So in terms of general comments, uh, the first speaker I have is Michelle. Uh, Majid, is she here? And uh, she's followed by Fernando and then Steve Levy. Okay. Sorry, I was a little disoriented. <laughs> um, well, uh, okay, where to start? This was a really jam-packed meeting. Um, the packet and information is super dense, and it came out just today. So just on the public side, not much uh, time to react to it in full. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, just general comments. Um, the discussion has been super lively, uh, super interested in the geography discussion, and kudos to folks who worked on that. Um, I do think to echo what we heard from some folks like Derica and Tamika and Jennifer, there needs to be some level of equity impact analysis atop all these policies, because even in our small group discussions, to think about it as a full package without knowing what the consequences will be as they're materialized in the real world, it's really hard to assess that. And just looking at this full package, it, there's still a heavy lean towards 1P. Um, and I think we would, uh, or I would argue, that there needs to be a more evenness among the Ps um, and a better sequencing before anything goes up for negotiation. Um, speaking of negotiation, it needs to be a clear and transparent process. We haven't really talked about how that'll be structured, and I think it's due time we do that. Um, all about a regional housing entity. We'll, we kind of um, discussed that a little bit here and there today, but I do think it's a real way to figure out how things coming out of CASA will have a place to live. Um, and I think, you know, there's both like the immediacy of what we're talking about in terms of uh, putting a compact together, but there's also a timeline of, okay, what does it look like in the next year, in the next two years, in the next five years? 
Um, and I think I just want to, I think Denise, you did a great job of really framing out in the geography section um, uh, why this is so um, relevant and important. Um, but I think like framing is one thing <laughs> and um, really knowing the effects of what we're proposing is incredibly important and should be centered. Um, this crisis has been about generate the way, you know, the way it, people live it is through generational um, wealth accumulation for some and generational disinvestments and poverty for others, which are the masses of folks who are being affected directly by this crisis. And so that's what we all are tasked with ending. Like that's the cycle we actually should be ending. So keeping that framework is I think very important and centered um, with whatever gets approved in this compact. Uh, yeah, that's it. Sorry for, I think we were just shuffling around so I wasn't quite <laughs> ready to make comments in full, but. Great, thank you. Um, next up, Fernando Marti, and then uh, the other general commonist, Steve Levy. Hi there, my name is Fernando Marti with the Council of Community Housing Organizations. Um, I'm just gonna riff on our, our little small group discussion that I thought was very useful, um, and, and again, thank you to everybody for all this incredible work, including Pedro over there who shepherded us through <laughs> a lot of discussions. Um, I think uh, one of the things that came up in looking at this list of 17 things is trying to understand it and trying to be able to communicate it to uh, folks outside of this process. What do these 17 things mean? Um, one way of doing that might be to really hone in on what it is that we're trying to do along those three Ps so we could put a bucket of, let's say, items one, two, three, and five as really being about protecting existing communities, right? And that's what we're trying to do. And I think people can understand that. We're trying to preserve our existing affordability. We're trying to produce more affordable housing, and you can kind of put the buckets in there under eight or uh, nine uh, or so forth. We're trying to create new missing middle housing that is very critical given the change in the housing economy since 2008. Um, and then we're trying to create more housing generally from the market. Um, so I think how, how we are able to express this is very important. I think we're also, um, we talked about, uh, uh, there was a little conversation about you know sharing the pain and whether we really want to talk about creating housing as sharing pain. Right? I think it's, maybe it's about sharing responsibility, but maybe more so it's about sharing opportunities. And it goes back to, I think, where a lot of these conversations started and about the role of MTC and our, about the role of transportation investments. These are places around the Bay Area that want the opportunities of investment. And if they want those opportunities of investment, they ought to be linked with the opportunities for housing that they are creating. And we shouldn't forget that linkage between what MTC and where they are going to fund and where the housing is built. Um, so reframing this is creating opportunities. Um, and finally, uh, Vikrant asked, asked us one question, which is what would we add to the 17 things? And, and I just threw out there, not necessarily as a, as a thing in itself, but there was a whole discussion about geography and opting out and, and what it means to be an at-risk community. I think what we're talking about is the opportunity for communities to plan their own future, Co opportunities for communities that have faced redlining and urban renewal and all these things. It's not about opting out of housing, it's about planning their own futures. And so that's the one thing that I would suggest adding um, as a key piece of what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve Levy, and then I was given two more cards. Uh, Sam Tupperman, Galfant, and Shajuti Hassan after that. All right, Sam. Hi, uh, Sam Tepperman Galfant with Public Advocates. Uh, really want to thank everyone who's put in so much hard work on thinking about how to uh, collect and winnow ideas that came up through this process. And the one thing I just want to point out is that I think um, we're talking about this as a package. And I think many of the policies only sort of work for any sector if other policies are also moving forward. And so 
just to echo something that is akin to what Derricka raised around funding, like uh, I think figuring out technically what are the mechanisms to bind these together, especially for things that might move forward through a state legislative process that are then gonna be battered by all of the forces and interests in the Capitol, um, and how do we make sure that we are, if, we're, if we want them to move as a package and think they work as a package, how do we make sure that they only move forward as a package? And so that's, I think, jumping a little bit ahead of what's in that package, but I do think that we should be um, careful that we're not creating a menu um, of options that then um, forces in Sacramento might pick and choose from based on existing power dynamics, um, but rather actually presenting a package at every stage. Thanks. Hi, I'm Shejuthi Hossein. I'm the new law fellow at Public Advocates. I'll be increasingly involved in the CASA process moving forward. So I have a few questions um, for the larger discussion and negotiations moving forward. I know during the funding conversation, we quickly passed by a slide with data on who the general public thinks um, is to blame for the housing crisis, but I'm curious if we have numbers or analysis on, um, on what really has contributed to the housing crisis, and if so, are we using those numbers to determine who is bearing the larger responsibility um, in terms of taxes? Because we pointed out that the responsibility may not be shared equally, but does that need to be shared equally or equitably? And lastly, is there data or numbers on um, whether and how these proposed taxes are passed on to low-income communities? That's the final, <coughs> excuse me, general public speaker. So with the next uh, half hour or so, we just wanted to kind of bring you all back into the uh, large group. And the idea uh, was not for us to go around and uh, just do report backs. I know we've all been in meetings where we've done that that haven't worked all that great. Um, so what we really want to do is kind of hear what your thoughts are um, based on some of the conversations that you had in your small groups, but also uh, based on conversations that you've been having in your walkabout. Uh, and also some of the stuff that's been uh, keeping you awake at night. And they're really just two questions that we have for you. One is, does this feel like the right package? Uh, and two is, uh, within these uh, 17, do we, have we identified the right negotiating points? Uh, and so, so, so for Fred. That. Yes, who's that? It's Michelle, <laughs> over here. <laughs> um, I have to leave and um, Andreas has already left. I think one of the things that we did discuss in our group and, and Fred was in it as well, and I kind of thought about it earlier when we were talking about the, the percentages, and one of the things that we did talk about is how does any of these issues address the homeless population and what are we doing? And I think we, we need to either, um, as we talked about, do, does it um, legitimize what we've been doing if we don't talk about it, or does it discredit us? And so I think at some point in time that we need to address it. As we look at um, our funding around the affordable housing trust funds, do we make it um, broad enough so where that you can include some of those fundings to address some of those issues? Because I think that is the underwhelming issue that people are seeing that is right um, in front of their face. I think the other thing that we discussed is um, can, we, can we do all of these at once and can, do we take it in bite size or do we just go for the whole shebang and bombard individuals? And then the other thing is um, the other parties that we need to have at the table and discuss and how we move forward with these issues. All right, I saw everybody talking in those small groups. <laughs> Doug, I, thank you. I think it is a really good balance. Um, I, I do think, you know, there's probably differences of opinion on that, um, but but I, I, I'm, I'm convinced there's a lot that's good in there. I think there are a couple themes that maybe are worth calling out and trying to figure out whether the package actually answers those. We've got clarity on, like, production, preservation, uh, et cetera. I think protection. I, I think the, the the couple things that jump out to me, one is it's not clear what the impact on municipal government is. I think you know one of the questions is should there be sort of a defining 
concept there around holding municipal revenue or obligations harmless. So if we, we take revenue away, we take obligations, we absorb requirements, whatever it might be, whether that's road building and road repair or some other thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm likewise a little uncertain about whether or not we've done an effective job of reducing the cost of housing production. I, I think we've got some stuff in there, but I, I don't think there's a lot um, of stuff that really gets at some of the issues related to the actual construction process itself that I think could, could feature in there and then be a complement to the impact fee piece. Um, and then to go back to the comments I made at the beginning, and I just would stress that I think these belong in here and I don't know how we do it. One is, I think we need to have a, an embrace of something that says, this compact is gonna promote jobs housing balance. Just gonna do it, we have to stay it. We're not gonna, we cannot solve the problem if we keep making the jobs housing balance worse. Nothing we do will, will possibly solve it. Um, and to that end, I think we should link the earlier conversation better to this conversation by saying, we are going to use tax policy to disincentivize undesirable zoning behavior or undesirable other behavior. Like we, we have to connect those dots in some way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if these are the only themes that do that, but I just, I, somewhere, somehow, we've got to get at this issue. Because if you look at a graph of what affects housing prices in America, regardless of market, all of the things we've talked about are specific to the Bay Area, but if you look across time and you look across geography, they're heavily dependent on job cycles and business cycles. And it is no surprise that we are having a hard time at a moment of peak business cycle that has been going on for a very long time. We're unlikely to affect the housing markets in as profound a way as we want unless we, we do something to acknowledge that relationship. And I, I think we've avoided the topic for a little bit too long here, so. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so great work. Thanks for all the um, effort that's gone into this. I think I also have a few overarching themes. Um, one is we're just in a funky space right now. I know this is the kind of beginning of the next phase, um, but when, when we talk about um, uh, anti-gouging in the, in the context of a Prop 10 conversation that's unfolding, um, that, uh, you know, how that plays out and potentially if Prop 10 passes future negotiations around rent control um, will be challenging. And so this um, will, be, will be, I guess some of this will become clear after the election is, is kind of a, a larger point. Um, and discussing this a lot before, some, for some of these things before November, given that they're so integrated with propositions in November, um, will be well suited to, to wait to see how they play out, as well as revise SB 827 and 828. Um, I don't have a good sense of the 828 bill that's in front of Jerry Brown right now, and I know 827 will likely be reintroduced. Um, in what form that takes, I don't know. So um, just the timing of this right now vis-a-vis -vis those pending bills um, presents some challenges. Um, and then, um, you know, I know that we're here to solve um, specifically the, the broad theme of housing inequality and housing issues. Um, and when I look at broad taxes, um, if I were to channel like the school districts or the firefighters or just all these other constituencies out there that I know will, you know, want a piece of money. Um, and um, when you think about RDAs, um, what are the incentives for taxing entities to be a part of an RDA knowing that they're actually foregoing future increment um, and is it opt-in or mandatory? Um, there'll be an exciting kind of future set of like rubber meets the road, how this stuff gets operationalized, um, and how do we create the right incentives to, to capture this money um, that I look forward to. But those are the big issues that I see on the horizon. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So um, this is really on the just cause and also on the right to counsel. I would hope if we haven't that we spend some time talking to the judicial system about what impact this would have on the courts which are already, mm -hmm. they would argue, underfunded with all kinds of cases backed up. You know, Are there models like housing courts that are used in some jurisdictions so that we don't have to have judges doing this kind of work that would allow things to move through quickly? So that's just something to think about. And then on the anti-gouging cap, I just want to be sure on the, um, we're talking about lim limits on the number of years of increases that can be banked is that we don't want to have a situation where somebody needs to make a major improvement in their building and may need an extensive period, you know, if we're going to limit how much they can raise the rent that they need a payoff that's longer than what you may normally see, that we don't 
discourage people from making improvements to their properties that could really affect the life and preservation of the property. So, Got it. Abby and Amy, and then I also want to encourage Ken and Autumn. I know you all were in discussions as well to jump into this as well. Yeah, my comment's mostly about framing. Um, mm -hmm. That um, I think as, as a subset or contingent of stakeholders is negotiating this compact and discussing it, I would... I would hope we could in parallel work on the framing around it because I think, you know, to where we started of where there are 50 actions and there's only 17 here, but some of them, you know, don't require negotiation hmm. or, you know, pretty straightforward or, or, or are grouped all together into better data collection. That having that, having that framing so that it's clear those issues are not dismissed, but it's that they don't, they don't need to be part of, you know, a really difficult set of agreements and that this is a subset of those things that, that does need to be the difficult set of agreements. I think that we just really, really need that, that you know, the, the package of what's wrapped around this rectangle. Mm -hmm. um, and then within this, I think, you know, we started on our conversation in our group about how, oh, there are 17 and that's still a lot. But, you know, when you start to, and I think Fernando was starting to get to this, when you start to actually group, you, you can actually group these into a couple of, a couple of categories, and I took a stab because we talked about it a lot in our group of, you know, um, starting with what Fernando said about protect, protecting existing affordability, holding cities responsible for building housing, building more affordable housing, and lowering cost and removing barriers, that it becomes much more manageable to be thinking about 17. All right. Amy. Yeah, um, to piggyback off of that, that was great. I really liked that. Um, I wanted to both highlight what Sam raised in public comment that resonated with what we discussed in our group about how, if this is really about moving together as a package, what is the mechanism to tie some of these pieces together so that some don't move forward while others are left behind and then that balance that we're aiming to achieve. So what is that mechanism to, to tie the compact together? Um, and then the other one that we talked about is, um, you know, that 17 is too hard to get your head around. So what are the different ways to bucket? So maybe Abby started to frame it out. Another way that we talked about framing it out is what is the package of state legislation that we need? And similarly, last year, we had a package of housing legislation and that we all as a, or many of us as a community got together to support that as a package. That wasn't too much. It wasn't too complicated. We, we could you know, navigate between the the dozen bills that we were all working on or however it was. So if there's a way to um, group them based on that next step that's needed, that enabling state legislation and how do we move that together or is there um, a, a, a group that gets bucketed around this is all falls under a, a regional housing entity that needs to advance this. I realize most of them have multiple mechanisms that needed to move to that next level, mm -hmm. but maybe that's a way to group and bucket. Cool. Ken. Yeah, so the, the group I facilitated had, a, I think, a really good discussion. There was a lot of overlap with a lot of the committee discussions based upon the, the feedback we've been hearing. Uh, one really strong comment was that the compact needs to hold together across the three Ps, both in terms of what it is out of the gate, uh, that the relationship between the three Ps is recognized and that they move forward together so it doesn't get peeled off at the legislature, uh, legislative level, and also that going forward that it needs to be supported and staffed appropriately to keep it going after CASA 1.0 wraps up. Um, there was discussion about the fact that Bay Area is very diverse in terms of jurisdictions and size of jurisdictions and markets and so forth. And so the rollout of this and how it proceeds should recognize that, uh, that there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the success of the 2018, 2017 housing bills. Um, there was some discussion about it, that it would be useful to distinguish between what elements would be best uh, advanced as regional items versus statewide items and that there should be engagement with the legislator, legislative delegation from the Bay Area about that as soon as possible. Um, and then also to identify the relative urgency of items, what looks good in the next year or two, what's more of a longer term effort. And then finally, I think there was a lot of support for the overall approach and the overall elements. There was some concern that right now it's still reads as a pretty heavy lean toward production and we should just make sure that things are balanced across the three P's and again that uh, we're moving forward with the three P's in unison. Uh, that's going to be the success of this effort. Great. 
Ada. So in our group, we had a couple of meta comments overall. Uh, one that hasn't been raised yet is around um, getting additional input from CBOs. Uh, we did a round of CBO outreach workshops earlier in the process and want to make sure we're going back to them. I, I believe, and Vikrant can clarify, that we are planning to do another round of outreach to, to community-based organizations, but just wanted to flag that. Uh, and also, there was a kind of a, I think, a good point about the, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about, about these negotiating points, but in, in some of the cases, the way the uh, description is written, it's kind of biased towards a particular outcome for some negotiating points. And so we just want to make sure that the, the language is consistent and not uh, implying that one uh, issue is probably going to go one way or the other if it's indeed a negotiating point. Um, and then there was a, a question around for the opt-out provisions um, for communities of concern, um, if those communities have a recently adopted community plan, uh, what does that mean? Do they go back to the drawing board or if they have a recently adopted community plan, do they not get to opt out uh, because they already have that plan, but maybe that plan was adopted under circumstances where they didn't know there was going to be, for example, you know, by right housing approvals. So what do we do about that? Got it. And Fred? Uh, sorry, so there was a third group of uh, that I was facilitating, and uh, I think most of the comments are captured from that group discussion as well, and some of the members uh, also came up to speak at the public comments. I think their input is good. Randy. Okay, three quick comments, and to pick up on a point that a previous speaker made is to not lose sight of impacts on schools. If we are able to successfully generate thousands and thousands of additional housing units, you know, our school districts around the Bay Area are in wide, have wildly varying states of capacity, and I know in, in, in Mountain View, all three of our districts are fully at capacity. They've already bonded for additional capacity. And as we bring on hopefully 20,000 more units, we have not solved or fi figured out a way how we're gonna pay for those additional school sites, not the least of which is a, somehow being able to acquire and pay for the land to put those schools on. So just wanted to point that out. The second part is, you know, this goes in the category of uh, discomfort or pain that I think we all see is within this compact in that, for there's a lot of things that talk about restricting um, uh, restricting local control or imposing minimum requirements upon cities and you know and you've heard me say this before but I would really encourage us to think long and hard about do all of the all of these apply to cities that are meeting the arena obligations or trying to do the right thing or are there there are certain provisions that uh, where a city can um, take a different path that gets to the same or a better uh, better approach. And the last part is that uh, this is a package of 17 initiatives within the compact. And I'm sure not all 17 will make it to the finish line and see the light of day. But um, however this process unfolds in the future, whether it's MTC, ABAG, or some uh, ongoing entity, will be the need to continue to monitor what is what is get, getting implemented, what is falling out, and how do we replace those uh, with another approach. Sure. Thank you. One, one other reflection sure. we had in, in our um, discussion was about uh, <clears throat> daylighting the, the process for having conversations or negotiations about um, uh, how we move forward and, and yeah. the importance of um, making sure that that there are the, the relevant stakeholder communities for the appropriate conversation. So making sure that we have the, the labor community represented, the affordable housing community, the, the city community, the environmental community, where those entities are particularly uh, needed. I don't think they're needed for, for each of these to have every single constituency represented, but we should just make sure that if, if it's a topic that directly relates to one of those communities, we found a way to allow that participation. Thank you. Anything else? I got, oh, yeah, go I, ahead. I just a couple of thoughts in my group that weren't said already. Um, the question of whether this is a truly CASA 1.0 of 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, and it <laughs> begs the question of how high do we reach? How many objectives? How much money? Is it baby bear or the papa bear? Is it too much or too little? And it, it all sort of rolls towards the question of. What's next? World peace, cure <laughs> cancer, and the like. 
Uh, so it begs the question, that, and, and at some point, I think we should try to address that. We've sort of moved it over to the housing agency as a place that this can live, but I don't know that we will satisfy the group if we if we haven't clarified whether this is a one-time big hit forever or this is the first and how we're going to deal with that. So that was a, an important conversation. The other one, and I'll, uh, it, this was mentioned in the group, and it was, I'll also channel Steve Levy. There was actually a sense we weren't covering enough on production, that we didn't cover things like modular housing and how to get the cost down and how to make cities who aren't doing their fair share uh, of real production do that. So, uh, and as Steve as you all know, is a fanatic about the missing middle. So it, it was an interesting, you, you get these different perspectives every time you do this. And so the, those were two that were a little different than what everybody else was saying today. Thank you. Linda, I saw you parking up over there. You know, I just, you know, I'm like Mike, I have a bias towards action and I have to kind of sit on my hands sometimes in this <laughs> process because it feels not fast enough. But we do have a, a new governor. Uh, one of the candidates uh, has as a central plank in his platform creating three and a half million homes for California. And I, I'm guessing he will come out of the box if elected fairly quickly with some proposals. And so mm -hmm. I do think we have a 1.0, a 2.0, a 3.0, and a 20-year plan. But I think we should get to some very short list that looks like how do we get on that agenda? and ride that train or those coattails if he is elected. When he, when we feel comfortable, he is asked specifically to see where this thing is at so that he can hopefully do what uh, Senator Weiner is doing and try to roll it into some thoughts he's got. All right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you never, never miss a meeting. <laughs> Amy, and then um, I'm going to I think pass it to you, Jennifer, to talk about next steps. Uh, two uh, quick points. Um, so going forward, it would be really helpful to have a lot of clarity around the negotiation process, how, we, I think people have mentioned that, but how, how um, is it the co-chairs and the committee chairs, is it um, that, com I think you mentioned before, it'll be a combination, maybe some representatives from both committees and, all, and the stakeholders that Matt said. So that's one point. Um, the other one, and this was triggered by you know Linda's comment around the new governor. I think that I know we're balancing between really bold and exciting and um, other other approaches or more incremental. But the we do have the the concept of a mega measure before us, and a mega measure is something that can get us to scale, has some resonance, got a lot of support. Um, in the committee, and I, I really think it would be important to uh, have out front as one of our big, bold strategies, if we can get the new governor behind it, um, it, it, could, it could really launch us in a really critical way. So I want to put that out there. Um, of course, we need to know what happens at the elections uh, around um, Prop 6 and see what happens around repeal of gas tax or not, but in terms of a major, a major initiative. Um, and then um, there's, there's just, or some, to state the obvious, there's some places around amendments to state housing law that we need, we just need to drill down and be really specific because there's just a, a very nuanced body of law and, and history around working on that stuff. So just calling for some of these places that need, well, maybe all of them need, need, need some digging. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thanks for all the feedback. Um, what's next, Jennifer? Sure, um, look, and we're doing um, well. So I, I'm going to channel the uh, moderators and, and the co-chairs and sort of lay out what we've talked about as the next steps, and then I'll, I'll let any, any of them jump in. Um, so uh, first would be a, a call for volunteers. So if you have one of these 17 or two of them that you have, a lot of thoughts or interest on um, the moderators kind of welcome your input on those to help shape those what's going to happen is each of these ideas is going to become a longer two page ish detailed um, proposal and the idea is to bring those forward in the October meeting um, so we uh, we hear the, the public and 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 all of you too that we need to get the package out a little earlier because it's going to be reading heavy um, so that's really the work ahead is to take all of your feedback plus the steering committee's feedback next week 
and to, to develop these out into kind of two pagers and then to bring them um, back here. Um, we'd like your feedback to go to the moderators, um, so please reach out to the four, any of the four of them. And we've been talking about, I'm going to look at, at, uh, at them, about a potential kind of Google form maybe as a way to get some feedback. Um, let me give the moderators all just a minute to, did I get that right? Do you guys have other thoughts? Um, yeah, so um, the past week's experience <laughs> taught us that we need to have more structured flows of communication for input to kind of cobble together all the different pieces that are going to need to come together. So over the next two or three days, we're going to be thinking carefully about that learning less, that lesson we've learned and figuring out what the right mechanism is to get, because the, the worst scenario would be having 25 people CC'd exchanging documents back and forth, <laughs> which is what happened. So um, we're going to figure out a different way that can be centralized. So it'll be more transparent as well. Um, and we'll be able to really assess w what the proposals are going forward in a more clear way, hopefully. Yes. If you have ideas and you know how to do something like this, please, uh, we invite them. <laughs> but by next Monday, hopefully, we will have something ready for you to start giving input. And we're working on a Google Doc format. But again, if you have other technology ideas, um, but that's what we're looking for is a Google Doc way of, of soliciting comments. Um, I might just also uh, kind of reiterate that we're looking, again, at comments at this very high level of what's missing, are these the right 17, have we captured the negotiation points, and we're not necessarily looking for really granular uh, things about, um, you know, are, are, is all the wording right? Um, but uh, we don't want to exclude that. But again, we're really trying to get that high level, that high level um, dialogue going to make sure that the package is complete. Denise or Linda or Derricka, anything I, I just, else? Yeah. I just have a comment about this because, yes. you know, I belong to several statewide associations that have been looking at CASA that are interested in potentially how we would declare a statewide state of emergency on housing and in, invoke anti-gouging. And so to the extent that you're part of groups that are already parsing this and have something written that might come to the table, we're very interested in sort of looking at what might have traction uh, outside of just this room and this table. Because some of this stuff, as we identified earlier, it could be statewide legislation. So you know, we're interested in hearing from you on that. Some of you are, are part of associations. Uh, I know Goldfarb did some work for us on what could HCD do if they adopted a toolkit? You know, we're really interested in collecting some of that in one place so that we can really look at um, some of these things. All right. I'll just say one other thing. So we also think that at some point in time, we can't just do this all online, and we can't just do it in a room of 40. So we will probably be, an, like, announcing a couple of sit-downs. Am I right, Denise, about this, um, where we're going to invite people to come and just, like, hash it out together in face-to-face -face or, you know, in the ring. Oh, you know what? The suit. We should get you, like, this big, like, sumo wrestler suit. I'd really enjoy that, Doug. Um, <laughs> and then put you in the ring. The, um, so the, yeah, so we want to be able to name it. So it'll be short, t you know, a short announcements timeline probably. Um, but come if you can or if you want to send somebody. And um, there will be a couple of, at least a couple opportunities for that kind of conversation. Great. Denise. It, it might, I, you know, we're, we're still figuring out what the best process is, to be honest with you. That's why you see us all kind of, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And um, so it, it's just a byproduct of everyone running fast and furious to try and keep, keep, keep moving while we're also continuing to communicate with lots of other people who are not even in this room. Um, so that being said, you know, I think a combination of forms of, weighing, of having input is what we're going to have. There'll be some sort of online form where you can record thoughts and we can read them and make sure we, we're, we're mindful of all the issues. I think that some separate meetings, maybe on specific topics or groups of categories, like a lot of these kind of fall into natural groupings. The, the tenant protection, right to counsel, that, that suite makes sense. And, and there are multi-party conversations that would help feed into what the term sheets could look like. A bunch of these are basically um, as Randy pointed out, you, you know, uh, 
land use, planning, administration, rule changes that will impact local government. So maybe that's a conversation that's cross, you know, cross silo, so we all can have that together. And maybe another one that's really about money, financing, you know, redevelopment, et cetera. And, and maybe we try and at least have three sub-meetings where we can get into the weeds on at least th those topics. I'm, I'm kind of making this up on the fly, but that makes sense to me. And then make sure that each one of those meetings reflects a diversity of opinion so we can try and shake out the details a little bit and talk about the negotiation points. If for nothing else, to daylight what remains to be discussed. Like we may not solve it, but we may identify things that we still have to work out. All right, well, thank you. Um, we're a couple minutes after two, so I think we should end. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention and